Hey, we're podcasting here. It's me, Will Menneker, back with another episode of Chapo. Joining me, as always, is Felix Biederman. Hello, everyone. Matt Chrisman. Hey, everybody. Uh, shout out to all the haters who are protesting in front of my pizza restaurant. Let me just tell y'all, you getting mad, I'm getting loose. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, Amber uh, Lee Frost. Howdy. Um... So this week's episode, we're doing a we're doing a book review. I wanted to talk about this book for a long time because it seems to me that it appeared on our national consciousness at the exact right moment to be adopted by the most obnoxious twits on both left and right as some sort of soothsaying prescription for the uh, the the jangled and harried times that we live in. And of course, I'm referring to the book Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Now, unlike other previous book review episodes where I've skimmed quite thoroughly all of the books that we've talked about on this show, I actually have not read this book. So joining us is someone who has. Please welcome Associate Editor at Commonweal Magazine, Matthew Sitman. Matthew, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, Matthew, you're working on a a book review of Hillbilly Elegy right now, correct? Right, right. I am. So you're you're Uh, very familiar with this book. I am, and I've followed the J.D. Vance phenomenon since it started, really. He is, he is a phenomenon. Uh, he sort he of is. came I out mean, of nowhere. He, I just saw he did a TED Talk. Uh, always, that's the mark of quality, it's, always. It's sort of, yeah, it's a, a symbol of something. Like, yeah, Matthew, I, w- I wanted to talk to you about this book, and I also wanted to talk to you about your background in life, because, you know, the, I, you, I first, I guess, sort of took notice of you be- when you wrote this article for Descent Magazine that talked mm-hmm. about, you know, you growing, like, the the town and community that you grew up in it called uh, leaving Con- you, re- you wrote about leaving conservatism behind and like your life story i guess it parallels in some way with jd vance's a right. little bit yeah i my the circumstances of my youth were not entirely different than jd vance's uh i definitely wasn't quite the appalachia hillbilly like true poverty but definitely working class blue collar Central Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh, where you guys were recently. Uh, but I came out of it with a very different political spe- perspective than him. Well, let's, let's start. Let's, I, I, want, I want to talk about the article you did for Dissent and how, right. like, where your sort of prescriptions and paths differ from J.D. Vance. But I think the thing that needs to be uh, underscored about J.D. Vance is just how readily and quickly this guy has been adopted as like the tribune or the soothsayer, the, the white working class whisperer, if you will, of both like the liberal and conservative media in this country. Right. Yeah. No, I think one, this is before the book came out, but I remember David Brooks in April during the primaries wrote this sort of mea culpa for the New York Times in his column where he said, you know, I just didn't know who these people were. I was stuck in my bourgeois strata as he put it, and he just didn't know any of these people voting for Trump. So that was the mindset, I think, of a lot of pundits, a lot of kind of mainstream writers uh, and journalists who they just didn't know where these people were coming from or what their experiences had been. And then into that gap stepped J.D. Vance and this book. And instead of actually having to, you know, experience some of the things these people experience, visit where they live, uh, they could sort of read this book and feel... Like they got it and were sort of tolerant. And and here was someone with a Yale law degree who was speaking their language and flattering a lot of their assumptions. You know, David Brooks was online at the Applebee's salad bar, but he wasn't looking at his fellow patron, the fellow patrons at the Applebee's (laughs) establishment. And as such of that, he missed. He missed the writing on the wall about Trump getting the Republican nomination and eventually the president. So I'm sorry, Applebee's does not have a fucking salad that's bar. That's a joke. <laughs> David, Bro- David Brooks wrote a whole book where he talks about going to the Applebee's salad bar. In, Wait, really? In his Bobo's in Paradise book, there's a whole section about Applebee's where he talks about using the salad bar there. Oh, God. I have to listen to the episodes of the show that I'm not on. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, you thought this was like my pronunciation of... Zine, but no, yeah. this is actually. Well, I mean, to be fair, you have a lot of strange pronunciation. That is true. Uh, I don't need to own Will again, but uh, the Applebee salad bar reference is actually from an interview he gave talking <laughs> about how Barack Obama was not connected to American folkways because he would, quote, not be comfortable at an Applebee salad bar, which is rendered even more hilarious because he was in that very quote showing that he had no connection to <laughs> yeah. the supposed grassroots of America. Let me be clear. 
I love all 57 of the condiment stations at the Applebee <laughs> Salad Bar. <laughs> anyway, so people like David Brooks and readers of the New York Times were shocked that uh, large swaths of America, of white America, were overthrowing uh, predictable patterns of behavior to right. go for a guy na- a guy like Trump, who in every on every outward appearance by their lights was a vulgarian, a fraud, a fool, um, but yet was speaking to these people in such a way that he could basically become president of the United States. In comes J.D. Vance, and this book is published at exactly the right time to explain to these people the culture of this forgotten white working class. So could you talk a little bit about what what is J.D. Vance's story, and how does he view this culture that he is sort of um, transcribing for an elite audience? Right. Well, um, the basics of... First of all, it's a memoir. Uh, so it's kind of told through the first person and his set of experiences. And it gives a little bit of background about that part of Kentucky and Ohio, the two states where he he grew up, uh, and a little bit of his family background, like his grandparents and great-grandparents, the stock, so to speak, he came from. Uh, And then it just walks you through some of what he experienced growing up, like... uh, you know, his mother's problems with drugs, uh, the way he was raised by a kind of collection of grandparents, aunts, uncles, a father who came in back into the picture later, uh, and then eventually makes it to the military and Ohio State University and then Yale Law School. And so that's a, bu- a lot of his childhood and adolescence in Kentucky and Ohio, and then, you know, him sort of making it and breaking through. And from that perspective, looking back from uh, you know, the vantage point of being in Silicon Valley, going to Yale Law School, uh, you know, he, he kind of, I think in the book, views himself as someone who can bridge that gap. He exists in both worlds, and he tells the story very much from that angle. Well, and liberals love the story of the one who got out. Right. And don't right. perhaps consider the possibility that the reason the that person may have, you know, quote unquote, gotten out uh, is because they are perhaps not the best representative of the community from which they have emerged. <laughs> well, like there's a couple right. things going on here because, like, you know, first of all, like he's he's a, he's a pretty good writer, right? Right. I have to say, um, reading the the bulk of the memoir, it, it didn't really set off my bullshit detector. Like he tells stories that are pretty harrowing at points that he doesn't play them up. He doesn't make more of them than he should. He doesn't write about them in a way that's obviously trying to you know, manipulate you emotionally in some way. So as a, just a literary document, it's, it's not bad. In fact, that's part of its success is he does this very well. But as you were getting at, it's the, the, the analysis he prov- provides. And because it's a memoir, he doesn't really, it's not a policy book, but he does give a prescription of sorts for what ails these people. It has the quality of being like, you know, not like you know, well-written, authentic, and this kind of first person narrative, right? right. That, that he mm-hmm. is bringing it to you. So it has, it, it has, it checks off all these authenticity boxes that exactly. people really crave mm-hmm. in trying to understand things like poverty in America, right. right? And there are a few anecdotes like his grandmother, like trying to set fire to, I think, uh, her husband, his grandfather. Uh, there's a family story of someone being like marred by a chainsaw. You know, he drops in a few things like that to, you know, give you the sense that this really is authentic. But yeah, it's it definitely checks those boxes. And like coming out of that, like you, you you alluded to it as well. But like him as a personal story also checks off all these boxes of sort of liberal and conservative meritocracy, right? right it's not exactly. that he just he comes from a a poor background with a like a drug addicted mother, and you know coming out of rural poverty and this kind mm-hmm. of the, this this forgotten class of people that are now asserting themselves electorally. Right. It's that, you know, he it's the pulled himself up by the bootstraps and specifically by joining the Marines and serving in Iraq, mm-hmm. then going to Ohio State, then Yale Law, and then becoming a venture capitalist in San Francisco working for, right. and this is the real name of the company, Mithril Capital Management, <laughs> an investment firm helmed by Peter Thiel. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Mithria, I want to point out, it's uh, one of Peter Thiel's, is a few things like this, where it's a fund named after some Lord of the Rings bullshit, and it also lost most of its value. There's something so just depressing about the fact that we're ruled by these fucking nerds. <laughs> I mean, 
At least like the old school robber barons were just these steely eyed syphilitic psychopaths. <laughs> yeah, these no, I genuinely miss it. The nerd dorks with their goddamn Lord of the Rings bullshit ruling over us with iron fists. JP Morgan was, was, JP Morgan was like seven hundred pounds overweight. He ate oysters for every meal. <laughs> Instead of coffee, he would drink a mix of morphine and bourbon. He refused to walk up any stairs, walk more than two blocks. He would take cabs everywhere. He was such a fucking drunk that he had a growth on the edge of his nose that looked like cauliflower. Fuck, <laughs> like, fucked strippers all the time. He was awesome. He did and, that thing that, like, American... Uh, uh, like millionaires do where they're like I want shit to look fancy and European so he would have like shit reproduced of like you know naked cherubs flying but he's like but also America so we would like put like an American flag in it it's like when Kanye was like I want renaissance babies but I want them black yeah 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 it's like that, that crazy like weird nouveau riche yeah. uh, thing that like they do where they're just like okay I want the authenticity of old world money, but also I want to adjust it to make it appropriate uh, for my context. He, he was an auteur, and he would he would have these dinners with all the strippers he was fucking. This is true. And he would have oysters, and they would put pearls in them, like just to give to people. Just Party spend favors. like millions of dollars on these dinners with... Just these like women, one third of his age and one tenth of his just body like, weight. Oh, here's like a thousand year old Ethiopian Bible and like you know yeah. some fucking Armenian book made out of like you know turquoise and here's like old antiquity and like he had at least a cool collection of shit. Peter Thiel probably has so many Lord of the Ring reproduction yeah. swords. Peter Thiel, <laughs> Peter Thiel's Peter Thiel, like yeah, compared to him, all he does is wear like dry fit quarter zip pullover shirts and like his big like his like his equivalent to JP Morgan having those pearl parties is like uh, I'm bringing my favorite Wikipedia moderators into a room and we're all going to debate circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Peter Thiel party. Okay, we're getting off track. Yeah, to uh, be yeah. fair, I've heard of, of some other Peter Thiel parties that are more debauched than the Wikipedia moderator one. B back, back to J.D. Vance, okay? So the, the subtitle of this book is it's Hillbilly Elegy, but the subtitle is A Memoir of Family and Culture in Crisis. And it's that mm -hmm. second part. It's the culture yeah. in crisis that, that forms, I think, a lot of the crux of this book, or at least the exactly. response to it. How does J.D. Vance talk about hillbilly culture? What does he make of it? Well, he, he talks about it in a few different ways. At the start of the book, he tells an anecdote of uh, he had a summer job or a job shortly after high school or college in some, some blue-collar job, uh, and they had trouble staffing it, actually keeping people in these jobs because – you know, someone would show up and he had a wife and a kid but didn't want to work and would quit after two days or something like that. Um, so he, he drops in a lot of those anecdotes, that there's a work ethic problem in the white working class culture. Um, the kind of paranoia and suspicion that mark this culture, he underscores that. And basically, like you said, the fact that that second word in the subculture, uh, in the subtitle culture, that's really the core of his critique of why things are the way they are and why these people are suffering what they're suffering. People are taking off work I, so that they can go under the tree by the fishing hole and tie a line <laughs> to their toe while they fall asleep. Right. Honestly, like uh, my grandparents are Appalachian and uh, they're like the, the super work until you bleed kind. Uh, mm -hmm. But there um, definitely is a fuck this job. I'll, I'll, I'll quit it. Um, Johnny Paycheck. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. There, yeah, there's take this job and sh sh shove it. And also there's just like, even older than that, like bluegrass, like I ain't going to work on the railroad, ain't mm -hmm. going to work on the farm, lay around the shack till the mail yeah. Trump train comes back, roll in my sweet baby's arms. Like, no, I would rather not work. I would rather fuck. And frankly, <laughs> that is the best thing about hillbillies is because there is horrible <laughs> shitty work. It's incredibly like a lot of the job opportunities there have been historically very dangerous and uh, also, like in the <clears throat> uh, in the con in the economy of a lot of these reg regions, like ramping up until the seventies, you could literally work for a few months and then just say fuck off. 
Well, this is a this is a trajectory that he does trace in the book, or at least in, in the reviews that I, I, I keep read in of mind it. as a Marxist and materialist, none of this means anything, and I'm not adhering to any kind of cultural. We're going to anyway, get to that. But. We're going right. to we're going to get to the what, what's wrong with uh, the cultural explanation yeah. for mm-hmm. poverty, which is everything. But right. um, like he does trace in this book an economic arc of right. u- upward mobility in these communities up until about the 70s and then a right. sharp downturn into what is now he quotes that more people in like in the town he grew up in in Ohio more people die of drug overdoses than natural causes now that was like last year right right so that's an important part of the story too is basically there was uh you know a migration of sorts out of Appalachia proper like real hillbilly folks to places like Middletown Ohio where his grandparents moved for a, a well-paying factory job in, say, the 1950s, that general time period. I and learned they are called butternuts. <laughs> right. Is this what historians called them? I only learned this from a, a The historian. people who moved out of the hollers to work yeah. at a factory were called yeah. butternuts? Yeah. I right, don't exactly. know why. They, it was the people who moved <laughs> out of the holler to do factory work, yeah. uh, roughly mid-century. And, and it was really his mother's generation, say, you know, as you said, the 1970s, where the decay seems to start in. Um, but he doesn't trace, he doesn't connect any of these dots. Like, why was there a well-paying factory job in the 1950s? Or what happened in the 1970s that might have, you know, put in place a different set of incentives or just different work environment, different work circumstances, different economic circumstances? He doesn't really, he's, he's telling a generational story, but he doesn't really connect it to the broader changes in the economy or political system uh, at all. He he talks a lot about like you know the world he grew up in was one of you know extreme family instability, mm-hmm. alcoholism, random violence, and right. just people that are quick to anger, and you know not a lot of stability in his life. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's a lot about hillbilly culture that he praises and sort of valorizes in a way. Yeah, I mean the general. Uh, sense of loyalty or kind of close knit families, even though it, that's in tension with you know, sort of family breakdown. But those kind of more tribal loyalties, you might say, are are virtues he he does respect. Well, and also he built his brand off them, so he can't throw them completely off of, under the bus. <laughs> Very right. much so. Now, mm-hmm. in preparing for this, I, I was reading. Uh, I wanted to like get a sample of how this book was received, and it was overwhelmingly positively reviewed. Mm-hmm. And I went to the the New Yorker review of this book by uh, Joshua Rothman that I think was, you know, the New Yorker is kind of like the standard of like, you know, what is like the elite media consensus right, exactly. on something. Yeah. Like this is like the height of, you know. Uh, it's of, representative. Uh, of, the, yeah, yeah. of the sort of cosmopolitan culture that supposedly looks down and condescends to the culture that, that mm-hmm. J.D. Vance came out of. And in the review, I found a, a lot of interesting things about the, the reception to this book. And um, quoting from it now, he says, um, the, the reviewer says here, uh, there is a no. Actually, sorry. This is this is JD Vance uh, being quoted here. There is a lack of agency here, a feeling that you have little control over your life, and a willingness to blame everyone but yourself. This is distinct from the larger economic landscape of modern America. And my question is: Is that is it? I don't think so. Um, well, and there's a couple different reasons why. One is he doesn't really get into the prehistory of this culture at all in terms of the way it might have come out of like company towns, mining towns that were um, just dependency breeding, um, culture destroying, soul crushing set of circumstances. And then out of that, his grandparents move to a new place, right? For some reason, that mobility seems, that kind of uncertainty that comes with with mobility, they, they moved to a new place. And you can see, actually, that that was a, a real linchpin to the story. He doesn't really underscore it, but um, his, his grandparents moved away from their family and their tribe and kind of didn't know what to do. Like, you know, they had uh, his mother, and let's say she's a difficult child. You know, before there would have been this coterie of aunts, uncles, family members, all kind of helping raise these children together, but now they're you know, in some house by themselves with neighbors they don't really know. And it was that move out of the holler. Uh, it, it kind of got the worst of both worlds, like the anonymity and uncertainty of a new place. But they brought with them the, some of the habits and traits that come from, you know, uh, decades of a certain kind of economic system in Appalachia centered around coal mining. Yeah, well, and and agriculture, too. I mean, you're talking yeah. about people that, like, like my papa had... 12 brothers and sisters 
<laughs> and my mom had nine. And those were just the ones that lived. And yeah. like, it, because they just never thought that they would move. They just never thought that they would do anything other than farm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they talk about like paranoia. Like, Appalachian people have pretty good reasons to be paranoid. I mean, like, yeah. uh, like <clears throat> just the Tennessee Valley Authority alone gave a lot of people a very short shrift. Um, you know, I obviously I supported a lot of people would still not have electricity if they did. But, you know, people were not properly reimbursed. There was all kinds yeah. of weird, fucked up, um, you know, liberal um, social reformers who sort of tried to covertly introduce sterilization programs. I mean, there's very good reasons for Appalachians to be paranoid. Yeah. And it would, you know, treat it as sort of like a colony within America. Yeah, because also, like, the fear of this, like, you know, hyper fecund horde of people living in the hills. Like, it's very, you know, it, it, yeah. they very much occupy the, the fantasy horror imaginations of, of cosmopolitan urban people. Yeah. And when it gets to that, when it gets to when Vance begins to discuss going to Yale and sort of seeing the other side of this mm-hmm. this culture, that that's where he gets into this idea of this is where he becomes like the the white working class whisperer to people like, for instance, right. Rod Dreher, who was mm-hmm. huge in pro- popularizing this book. <laughs> This idea that it's really, it's the snobbery of the other people and their condescension that is feeding into the dysfunction of this, the, the culture that he comes from. Right. And I want to, there's one thing from this review here that I want to point out. He says, white poverty, Vance, this is Rothman, the reviewer, white poverty, Vance comes to feel, is a source of special shame. No one at Yale sees dignity in it. Instead, they define themselves in opposition to people like him. One professor says that, in his opinion, Yale law shouldn't bother accepting students from non-Ivy League schools, since it's not his, he's not in the business of, quote, remedial education. And I think that this is like, obviously, I mean, like, that's an asshole thing to say. I'm shocked to find out there's elitist jerks I, yeah, at the Ivy League. But what I think he's doing here is I think there's sort of a sleight of hand in which Yale, Yale Law School and the Ivy League is his shorthand for cosmopolitan values and liberalism writ large, right? right? Not right. just a very distinct subset of a highly elite culture that is right. maybe a subset of just East Coast, not you know, Southern or Midwestern hillbilly culture. Right. He extrapolates a lot from that. Uh, and some of those stories he tells about being at Yale Law are actually kind of interesting. Like, and I identified with some of them. So when he was, uh, you're looking for his first summer law gig, uh, you go through this onerous interview process where, you know, uh, you end up having dinner after multiple rounds of interviews, you end up having dinner at a fancy restaurant with these partners at the firm that might hire you. And he talks about not knowing which fork to use or how to order wine. You know, he, there's a great story where the waiter comes over, what kind of wine do you want? And he knew red versus white, but he said, I'll take red and, or whatever it was. And the waiters like, well, what kind of red, you know? And as someone who, grew up in circumstances not totally different than his, who lived in D.C. I, I went to grad school at Georgetown and found myself in very similar circumstances, kind of in a very short period of time, just you know, moving in very different circles. Uh, that resonated. Uh, but, you know, there are other times where he talks about professors who were, like, critical of the war in Iraq. And as a veteran, he was just, you know, he views that as condescension. Right, as like an anti-military attitude when really, you know, you look back, there's a lot of good reason to be horrified by what happened in Iraq, including the behavior of some of our military there. And, you know, suspicion about our adventures in the Middle East is not ipso facto bigotry or condescension or anything like that. I think this gets to like the sort of catch-22 that, uh, that's at the heart of this book about how he views hillbilly culture that he comes from and mm-hmm. this kind of elite culture that looks down on them. And I want to mm-hmm. read, this is again from the New Yorker Review. This is Rothman mm-hmm. writing here. He says, this is, this is Vance talking about Obama's comments during the 2008 election, the famous line where he said, you know, if you look oh. at these towns, there's no jobs, there's no opportunity, and they cling to their guns and religion as a <laughs> source of identity, which Obama got slammed for. To this day, right. people still... Uh, right, it's a right-wing trope. Yeah, now. it's a right-wing yeah. trope. Uh, you know, Rothman says in the article, well, what, you know, what, Jay, what, he, what he's saying in this book is really not that much different than what Obama was saying 
in that. But it, Vance, okay, so he says, Vance conceded that Obama's comments had been well-intentioned and that he had named legitimate problems. Nonetheless, he said, Obama's comments lacked sympathy. Reading Hillbilly Elegy, you see what Vance means. Vance is after a certain kind of sympathy, sympathy among equals that doesn't demean or condescend. Such sympathy can't be deterministic and categorical. In fact, it must be a little judgmental. It must be the people to whom it's extended as dignified individuals who retain their moral obligations. Okay, like this is the contradiction to me. Vance is a conservative, right? Right. He's still a right wing. He's still a Republican guy. So... He, he's looking at these, the, the causes and, uh, of poverty, mm-hmm. right? But he wants people to talk about it in a very singular way. And I think what he wants is sympathy on his terms, exactly. right? Where you have yeah. to respect the culture they're from, but what he doesn't want is any political engagement with that culture outside of basically Republican economics. Right, exactly. So he, he does, you use the term sleight of hand, that's exactly right. So he wants us to not condescend to this culture, uh, but he refuses to talk about it in any way other than what lines up almost perfectly with right-wing talking points. Another way of putting it is that Vance wants to be this brave truth teller, right? He tells these people they need to get their life together, they need to shape up, or you know, they're going to continue to be mired I'm in these terrible I'm just so glad rednecks have our own Bill Cosby right. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, no, see, he's like... Uh, we pull, do need to pull up our pants. Yeah, but pull instead, up that car hard jacket. It, yeah. Instead of pull up your pants, it's uh, pull up your ass flaps on your prospector underwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is, it is an amazing symmetry, isn't it, between the liberal attitude, which says we must give sympathy to poor deserving people, and by deserving they mean members of a oppressed racial minority and fuck off to poor white people because they're racist. And this is basically, no, you have to have sympathy for poor white people too. But in both cases, all it means is exhibiting a public sense of, of you know, oh, I feel your pain and, and not ever transmitting that into any kind of policy that might alleviate it. Yeah. Right. Well, there's a... There's a uh, a piece by uh, Adolf Reed called uh, What Are the Drums Saying, Booker? The Curious Role of a Black Public Intellectual, uh, where he talks about this kind of direct correlation. And these liberals like love to elect certain representatives of, you know, marginalized groups. And, um, you know, they view them as translators. And the metaphor he uses is uh, this this show... Uh, Ramar of the Jungle, where um, there's some uh, there's some white guy who has who has a native uh, uh, whatever sidekick interpreter interpreter yeah, yeah. and uh, you know the native people would be like playing drums to communicate and he would say what are the drums saying Booker <laughs> and uh, yeah this guy he's just a hillbilly yeah. Booker. He's uh, been elected to to be a translator because he tells them exactly what and the whole thing like that's it it's this weird kind of like single source representation mm-hmm. uh they're only going to let they're not going to let like dissident views in like they found their one hillbilly and that's who yeah. who they're going to use to uh you know form their their ideas about the politics of mm-hmm. of rural white working class people uh i can I read a passage yeah, from the book? Do. Because it gets at something important. And when I read this, this is when uh, the gig was really up for me. I thought he showed his cards most strongly here. So uh, as we mentioned, he's sort of this brave truth teller, supposedly about the white underclass and working class white culture. But I, there's a, toward the end of the book, there's this amazing passage where he goes through uh, you know, the percentage of people who believe Obama is a Muslim, or that he was foreign-born, not an American citizen, those kinds of statistics. And then, uh, I'm quoting now, reading from the book, many of my new friends blame racism for this perception of the president, but the president feels like an alien to many Middletonians for reasons that have nothing to do with his skin color. Recall, (laughs) no, listen, listen, this is so unbelievable. Recall that not a single one of my high school classmates attended an Ivy League school. Barack Obama attended two of them and excelled at both. He is brilliant, wealthy, and speaks like a constitutional law professor, which of course he is. Nothing about him bears any resemblance to the people I admired growing up. His accent, clean, perfect, neutral, 
is foreign. His credentials are so impressive that they're frightening. He made his life in Chicago, a dense metropolis, and he conducts himself with a confidence that comes from knowing that the modern American meritocracy was built for him. Of course, Obama overcame ad adversity in his own right, adversity familiar to many of us, but that was long before any of us knew him. So if you boil that down, he basically says these people weren't bothered by Obama because of his skin color, but because of his accent, which is just <laughs> un well, maybe he's right because unbelievable. You, the background that he described, I mean, look at George W. Bush has an right. Ivy League silver spoon back. Right. His dad mm -hmm. was vice president and head of the mm -hmm. fucking CIA. He grew right. up in Maine, mm -hmm. but his accent sounded like an asshole. So right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so so suddenly the the sort of criticism of white culture, and if you were going to be critical of white working class culture, racism would be, you know, and that, that would be part of the things you would want to criticize. Well, here's I think. the thing, like, and then like, you know, he, he talks in detail about this dysfunctional culture, right? I mean, like even about his own relatives, I think mm -hmm. at one point in one quote I read from the book, he describes like, you know, how teachers didn't understand like, you know, what do you do with kids when they're being raised by wolves? <laughs> like he refers right. to them as like actual wolves and talks about the violence and drug addiction and he mm -hmm. even quotes the uh, their quote bizarre sexism and, and incuriosity as well i love the idea that like sexism is somehow bizarre as yeah, if like yeah. it's not just the way 99.999 percent of the world is like it's not the consequence of critical thinking and logic <laughs> <laughs> so right so like this is his description of this culture so like what what does he want people like so let's say someone like me to respect in that like what is he what is it where is the sympathy he wants to come from what is the respect he wants to come from and i think from what i can glean from this the answer boils down to the their patriotism their mm -hmm. sort of religiosity and all of the things that right-wing social conservatives extol right. in nor in white people basically, basically right. you're supposed to like all of the stuff that makes them vote republicans when they do exactly. vote yeah. and hate all of the stuff that conforms with the stereotype of Black urban culture. Yeah, I, right. yeah, like I think the, Matt, that, that, like, that, that's the bad stuff. And by the way, it's kind of amazing to me that the that the the cultures, the subcultures in America that have to be pathologized and described in terms of their just inveterate, self defeating pathology are also the ones that are the most hard hit by economic dislocation. That seems like a weird coincidence that communities that have the most distressed relationship with the changing economy are the ones that have the most pathologizable uh, cultures. That's a weird coinky uh, Now, Now, this gets into the whole economics versus culture right. debate. Yeah. And, and to get there, I want to go back to this New Yorker article again because I think it's very instructive about the way this book has been received by the sort of broader elite media political culture. Rothman writes here, It is through these backdoors of memory and family history that Hillbilly Elegy arrives at its broadest subject, our hopelessly politicized approach to thinking about <laughs> poverty. <laughs> this theory is useful to politicians because political ideologies function by identifying some people as powerless and others as powerful. The truth, though, is that in the culture of versus di economics dyad is largely a fantasy. We are neither prisoners of our economic circumstances nor lords of our culture able to reshape them at will. Again, it liberals and conservatives mm -hmm. both believe what Milo believes, which is that politics is downstream from yep. culture. He says, it would be more accurate to say that cultural and economic forces act with entwined and equal power and through all of us, and that we have an ability, limited but real, to harness or resist them. I just got to say, I love this style of essay writing where it's just like you get to the conclusion, then you're like, well, actually, the issue is pretty complicated. And the answer is a little bit of both. Yeah. He goes on, he says, only oh. one guy can do it and make it good, make it good <laughs> and he's a father. <laughs> Works for Cranes Detroit. Y'all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Love that boy. Give it up for man. <laughs> hey, uh, just one more. He says, and yet it would be wrong to see Vance's book as yet another entry in our endless argument about whether this or that group's poverty is caused by economics or cultural factors. Hillbilly Elegy sees the economics versus cultural divide as a dead metaphor, a form of manipulation rather than explanation more likely to conceal the truth than to reveal it. Uh, There's more truth there than the reviewer knows. Yeah, uh, it's concealing a lot, but he's lying to himself that this book isn't 
absolutely an argument for the cultural forces totally. that make yeah, poverty. I mean, that's yeah. an anti-materialist yeah. argument. And, and it's really the most traditional conservative thing. It talks about the breakdown of families. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it talks about, like, gee, I wonder why families break down. Gee, I wonder, I wonder how, you know, if displacement and employment has anything to do with that. I wonder if there is any correlation between drug addiction and injuries during, uh, you know, hard physical labor and just human misery. And just hopelessness yeah. and just yeah. general. And also a, 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 a unwillingness to work when the only jobs on offer are fucking soul and body destroying nightmares. Yeah. It's yeah. so amazing watching these people tut tut people's fucking work ethic <laughs> when they sit in an air-conditioned <laughs> office and go, oh, you know, sometimes uh, it's both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fucking, yeah like... Uh, MacBooks and act like, well, they don't have the work ethic that I do. By the way, when's lunch? I feel like <laughs> yeah, J.D. Vance's literal job is to, like, ride Segways next to Peter Thiel and be like... <laughs> Uh, uh, let's give two billion dollars to another blog. <laughs> it's, and he's like shit talking everyone from his hometown. Like they're lazy. They could never do my job. Where I would where love I have to see him go back to his hometown. Yeah. I would pay. blanket well, party. Well, well, here, well, here's the uh, here's the follow up, uh, Matthew. Can you fill us on? Uh, JD has sort of gone back to his hometown, and by his hometown, he means Columbus, Ohio, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because that's where the airport is. Yeah. Lose all the money. They constantly fuck. <laughs> it up they, they spend their uh, money on big shiny yeah. bikes they spent their entire income from a year taking their bikes to ireland to find a baby <laughs> Wait, uh, but Matthew, what are his yeah. prescriptions yeah. could though? you give us a follow-up like, on like yeah he's going yeah. to columbus ohio specifically to do like the charles murray thing and get back in touch <laughs> with the real right. america and provide them investment capital opportunities in the hollers or what uh, well well it's sort of a two-stage process so first he wrote a piece in the new york times not that long ago called why i'm moving home uh, and after actually name checking charles murray <laughs> seriously <laughs> uh, he's and he does that in the book too he, he said he read a couple books in preparation for this one of which was coming apart charles murray's book uh he said he's moving home to start a small nonprofit to uh confront the opioid epi- epi- epidemic um, but then a news report came out just just like within the last week that he's actually, uh, in addition to that, uh, starting something with a venture capitalist in Ohio, bringing venture capital to the people <laughs> of Ohio Hell to yeah. help them. Uh, oh, to all those no, Appalachians no. in that fucking college town, uh, Columbus, Ohio. No, um, I mean, just can I read from this? Yeah, go for it. It's, there's so many things that you, will just make you want to scream. Um, the Hillbilly Elegy author is joining Revolution LLC, the venture capital <laughs> outfit founded by Steve Case, the, the old AOL guy. The duo, who initially met on Twitter, uh, want to focus specifically on neglected areas of the country. And, and then it mentions his continuing affiliation with Peter Thiel. So he's, he's not just starting some nonprofit to help opioid addiction. He's actually going back to do the service of venture capital uh, this is, with, uh, with the AOL guy. Uh, <laughs> and I, and it, it's very vague. Like the, the article doesn't really describe what, None will there be like apps for, plans. you know, will they be d- further disruption? Will there be apps? Will there be... He's going to have sympathy some, for people addicted to fentanyl, but the right yeah. kind of sympathy. Yeah. It's yeah. like Uber, <laughs> but for sympathy. Yeah. Not, not too much, <laughs> but not too little. He's going right. to bring back the AOL 500 hours of free internet CDs, but he's going to be like, look, you can either use these CDs to get online, go to monster.com, go into Peace Corps, go to coding camp, do anything, or you can use them to snort oxycodone. It's your choice. I'm hoping that he brings the microloan uh, model to the United States. So that, like India, we can have hundreds of rural Americans committing suicide <laughs> jumping into wells because they can't pay back JD the money I, that they fucking I borrowed. I have to know, though, does he ever comment on how Appalachia used to be like a democratic stronghold? I, I honestly... Like, does uh, he uh, make any reference to, like, the massive union participation well, that used to he, exist? He does kind of... Uh, I was flipping through pages on my way here again, and there is a point I, I saw where he said, yeah, like, the generation above me were these solid sort of blue dog Democrats. Um, and b- then he moves on to say he's more conservative than them. And uh, I mean, this so is I, totally anecdotal. I could, be forgetting it. I could be forgetting it. But. This is totally anecdotal. But like 
as uh, someone of hillbilly extraction, uh, I am I am allowed to I say to anecdotes. I'm allowed to say anecdotes are actually yeah. uh, fact mm-hmm. and data. But like my grandparents literally just stopped voting when there wasn't a coal ca- like when they moved to Indiana to literally work at paper factory uh, uh, because there wasn't any, there wasn't a union candidate anymore. Like they mm-hmm. literally just used to vote for who the union <laughs> like, right, yeah. you know, supported <laughs> and they don't, they didn't have that anymore. And it's just, yeah. they were left disenfranchised without, without uh, any kind of labor base. Well, Felix, this, this goes to something you were, you brought up uh, before we started recording about this idea that like, Guys like J.D. Vance and like this whole cottage industry around, you know, him and this whole topic of like the white working class, what to do about them. Oh, like their backward social attitudes. Like, ooh, can we reach out to them? Just obscures the fact that like that these people, the same way that Yale is being like Yale Law School is being used as like the totem of cosmopolitan, like liberal America. But also talk about provincial. Talk about fucking hillbillies. Talk about people who until like... 80 years ago were still marrying their cousins yeah, I mean, yeah, which yeah. we never did that was always <laughs> upper class who do, you, who, who do you think has more overlapping chromosomes so fucking Winthrop or somebody from a holler yeah. <laughs> you may be surprised uh, yeah no but there but is this, we yeah. are not fucking our cousins we however you look at someone who has a town named after them there are multiple cousin marriages yeah. in that family but yeah well what I was saying was that there is the immediately well I mean during the election during the rise of Trump during the general when Trump would catch up and then after he won there was this obsession with finding someone who had the divining rod for poor white people Mm -hmm. because media people think that they understand poor black people because they you know they they listen to Illmatic or something and they're like (laughs) I understand that they're good I saw the wire yeah I saw the wire I get it now I watched Reading Rainbow but, uh, (laughs) but they've never really known like a type of poor white person if they run into even like a middle lower middle class white person they may write some sort of rambling hysterical Facebook post about how they're gonna kill them but but at, at its core this obsession is classism because you see this great ground this great shift of conservatism from sort of soft nationalism soft racism as you think it is soft imperialism to just the very hard right version of those things and it's very gauche and you maybe saw a few pictures of a guy who you think may be a hillbilly you don't know because you've never actually seen one and you go that's the groundswell of trump support (laughs) ignoring the data that you worship and the information that you love you Live your life as this data wonk, but you don't look at the actual data, which tells you these. these, these oh, yeah. There's no groundswell. Yeah. These are the same people who've always voted for Republicans. They're, yeah. You're, totally. You know what? They're the shitty parents of whatever fucking New York or DC media worm who is working for the Ezra's and the Matts and the et cetera. Yeah. But <laughs> they, you know, there's a resistance to look at, at this, you know, A, pure classism. B, because, well, the Democratic Party's model for the last 30 years was trying to win these fucking people, (laughs) and it didn't work. So they get to kill two birds with one stone. They get to, A, not understand that there is just a deeply reactionary element to the bourgeois, and two, they get to sort of obscure the biggest failures of the Democratic Party, pretending like they Mm -hmm. offered them something really great by just saying, uh, well, the the part of the hillbilly brain is fucked up, and they they're too racist to vote for Hillary Clinton, who's a WOC. Is the people who look at like fucking Duck Dynasty or the Bundy Ranch and don't see the fact that these people are, for lack of a better word, like shucking and jiving hillbilly shit when they're actual fucking millionaires? Like when you're driving the eighty thousand yeah. dollar pickup truck. Yeah. yeah. You know? Have you been to the hauler recently? Like even Jim Goad, who's a piece of shit and a moron, bemoans this. But uh, they're pretty globalist these days. They love rap music. <laughs> they're wearing, okay, they're wearing FUBU from the 90s, but like, it's there. They're like, J Rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are. Yeah. <laughs> Brendan, edit in some J Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so JD's going back to. Going back to his hometown in Columbus, Ohio, and like you know, just thinking about that, I had the idea, just J.D. Vance just going, here is to venture capitalism, 
the cause of and solution to <laughs> all of the white working class wait, problems. Wait, wait. And, then, <laughs> and then he says, yeehaw, and sticks your hand in the air no. like, the, like the oil Texas guy, I got it. because that's what he thinks. Hillbillies are like at this point. He's been so far removed. Well, the thing is, like, okay, so he's going to bring, so obviously he's one of these dipshits who thinks, well, we're going to we're going to solve this problem by bringing opportunities to these people, exactly. which is the same thing liberals say about the inner mm -hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, by very definition, even if you were to do that, and even if those opportunities were offered, a small percentage of people in those areas would be able to take advantage of them for a, a exactly. bunch of reasons. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the, But then the, the question remains, well, what about everybody else? Well, J.D. Vance... I figured out who he is. He is not. Uh, he's not. You know, Homer Simpson, cause and solution to. He's Raylan Givens. <laughs> he came back from a coastal city because you know, with Raylan Givens, it was a it was a shooting with him. Like he accidentally invested in like a child porn startup. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you can edit that out but <laughs> if you want. If you don't want to accuse him of investing in child pornography, but they were like. We're reassigning you to where you came from, the holler. <laughs> and he goes back down, and there's a Boyd Crowder there who's like, I like being ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't going to change me, JD. <laughs> And they sort of, he's... I see you've become mighty loquacious since your time <laughs> at Yale Law School. Now, li <laughs> advanced advance. Now listen to me, Boyd. By the time I was 18, I would mastered spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and it's justified, but it's about justified uh, using eminent domain to take all of their property and turn it into an Uber self-driving car station <laughs> and uh, call, and using the remnants from their holler to make a super coffin for Peter Thiel to live in. <laughs> and the end of the series is... J.D. Vance and Boyd Crowder, they're talking to each other through the glass, not because Boyd is in prison, but because that's where J.D. Vance has decided poor people should live. <laughs> in sort of like... Just fixing problems. Yeah, yeah, just sort of glass cubes. Yeah. J.D. Vance, he's like got his hand across it. He's in a mech suit that rich people now wear at the end of the Justified J.D. Vance series. And they've sort of, they, they've gone through a lot, him and Boyd Crowder. And they both say at the same time, we said slurs together. <laughs> I just think I, I hate the guys. I hate all of these fucking any of these things that want to uh, make to, to like do crocodile tears about these these lost communities and then try to make half hearted attempts to contextualize their pain. But at the end of the day, say, hey, what's going to happen to them is going to happen to them because we've enshrined capital as the protagonist of civilization and actual human lives are just grist in this blood mill to get <laughs> spit out and turned into whatever capital decides to do to them. Well, can, can I, can that's I, what you think. If you think the capital is the protagonist of history, then you should not give a shit about any of these people. And you should say, if you're too fucking stupid to make it work, then you get destroyed. As Alan Greenspan said about uh, Atlas Shrugged, you know, those who lack purpose uh, or dignity will perish as they should. And I have way more respect for that than people who want to pretend that they give a mm -hmm. shit about humans when they've decided to put all of their efforts behind uh, exacerbating economic trends that do nothing but destroy them. Is there a sense that he thinks of, because I find this incredibly common with liberals, it, I assume it might be similar with conservatives, but they think of like, rural poverty and urban poverty as being two entirely different species despite the fact that there's like joblessness mass depression alternative economies that have to form in this vacuum horrible horrible environmental disasters everyone dumps their garbage in Appalachia too people don't realize like there's terrible horrible like there's flints all over the country oh yeah uh like does does he think that like that that they're that they're different beasts or something you know i i can't really tell he doesn't really dive into that he writes mainly out of his own experiences and the way he talks about i think it's worth underscoring the way he talks about possible solutions to this which we've been circling around uh Obviously, if you were to reverse engineer, if you were to start and say, how could I write a book to kind of talk about the white working class, but leave no structure, um, 
changed at all. Just leave everything untouched. It would be this book. Uh, because obviously he thinks venture capital is part of the solution. But the only real policies he talks about in the book are, he'll say things like, well, you know, the government should help if they can. But really, you know, it's always the but really comes in. But he does talk about um, reforming payday loan lenders to make it easier actually <laughs> to get to get to get loans uh and he gives this awesome. example of like Good. you know getting a, a page like what if you want to take some girl I out on a date it, and, i called it yeah. micro loans come to appalachia yeah <laughs> yeah uh and i really i do want to underscore this on this show especially for you felix uh he does talk about family court and custody oh, yeah. law yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah and he doesn't make it he actually has a decent point that like in these confused family situations you could just sticking them with the dad who's like three states away might not be the best thing for the kids. But like when you're really talking no, about him. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like really actually addressing these problems, a mix of payday loan reform, uh, family court shit and uh, venture capital just is not going to do it. Yeah. What if what if you could put your own bones on layaway <laughs> and someone could <laughs> rant your femur or something? These are the ways that we can get over the systemic non-cultural cultural poverty uh, of Appalachia. Well, like I said, I I, I think that, you know this is why JD is he's doing TED talks. Mm -hmm. Matthew, you think he's going to definitely going to run for office at some point, right? Uh, I think that was part of what was behind the move back to Ohio. Um, oh, right. And whether he runs in Ohio or Kentucky, I'm not sure, but both um, Mitch McConnell and... Uh, but he's in Columbus. Yeah, yeah. They're not no, I, like a Senate, right? I don't know. But okay. like a bunch of politicians from Ohio, Rand Paul and um, maybe Kasich or McConnell. Do so you think he would like they, shoot high? I don't know. I, I really well, don't know. He's got this huge media pro, you know, platform yeah. now and like everybody's kissing his ass. Yeah. And he can get on like any mm -hmm. TV show and be praised as this kind of like the guy with the solutions or the Every guy with fucking the, Ivy yeah. League yeah, New exactly. Yorker yeah. writer yeah. is yeah. like, I'm oh, what are those drums office. saying? <laughs> yeah. Well, to those drums, I just actually want to read the end of the New Yorker piece because it's <laughs> hell, a hell of a denouement. I don't know what the answer is <laughs> precisely, but I know it starts when we, this is, this is Vance writing here. I don't know what the answer is precisely, but I know it starts when we stop blaming Obama or Bush or faceless companies and ask ourselves what we can do to make things better. Yeah, exactly. Faceless it's companies. <laughs> by the way, no, by we, the way, I would say this too. If someone were to write this book and talk about, say, urban black poverty or uh, border town, uh, you know, uh, Mexican Americans. The New Yorker would be way, way, way gentler with uh, endorsing any of the bullshit that someone would say about that. Yeah, absolutely. There's just like no fucking way you could get away with with being like, well, you know, maybe it is a culture of poverty. Not in the fucking New Yorker. You'd have to tap dance your way around it. You have to use all kinds of weird bullshit liberal language to like pretend like you're not being racist. And guess what? That speaks to exactly his point about how these people do condescend. To, to what? They're fucking East Coast liberal condescending assholes. Just the, okay. So this is this is this is the path that, that JD took uh, out of poverty to the Marines and eventually to to Mithril Capital and then <laughs> and then, and then Valley, back yeah. to Columbus to bring opportunity to the to, 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 <laughs> back to, to Mordor, to, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I alluded to it at the beginning, like Matthew. I want to talk to you ab about. Your your piece, you know, you this essay that you wrote for your Descent magazine about sort of leaving your conservative upbringing and beliefs mm -hmm. early in life. Your you know your background is not too different from JD's. Uh, you know, you had a, 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 a your father worked in a factory in Central Pennsylvania. Right. Mm -hmm. The essay opens with a very moving part where he like takes you by the factory every time you drove past it and said, "Don't ever go there. I don't ever want right. to go back to that. Like yeah. that's how hard. That's how bad it was." And like you know, also uh, a similarly conservative religious background. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, like, what what led what led you to like a different a different path, or like uh, to look at the economic rather than the cultural? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, it took a long time. I mean, it didn't happen overnight. Um, I actually I wrote this essay because. Uh, Michael Kazin uh, was one of my teachers in grad school, the editor of Descent. And uh, I met him when I was 22 or 23, I guess. And he was teaching this graduate seminar on American conservatism. And this is like the height of the Bush years, right? When the, the left and liberals are really on the defensive. And he said he was teaching this to uh, 
figure out how to win, you know, why, why the left was losing. And he said, I, I'm teaching this class, but I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a card-carrying member of the American left. And we went around the seminar table, and he got to me, and I said, I'm Matt Sittman, and I'm a card-carrying member of the American right. You know? <laughs> and you know, like here it is years later, he sees me on Twitter like talking up Bernie, and he just sends me an email and says, you should write about what happened. And so that's kind of how the essay came about. Um, but really, I think it was... You know, when I lived in central Pennsylvania, uh, class was not something I was conscious of, like literally, because uh, everyone around me was basically the same. There was no old money, certainly, and the new money that existed, like the rich guy in town would own the uh, uh, garbage pickup service or like had a small business that, that, that did well, right? And those were like the rich people I knew or not really that rich, but rich by central Pennsylvania standards. And it was moving away, living in D.C. Um, I lived in Charlottesville, Virginia for a couple years. I, I taught at UVA for a while. And then I moved to Manhattan uh, to, to do the work I do now. And it was really, I think, the juxtaposition of those different experiences I had. Uh, and it just, things clicked eventually. Um, and, and, and there was a lot of reading involved. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of the economic history of the last... 40 or 50 years that I'm just shocked more people don't know. And that even someone like J.D. Vance can write this book and just have no, no idea of the changes that have happened systematically over the last few decades. If I could just read uh, yeah. <clears throat> briefly from, sure. from your piece in Dissent, you write, leaving conservatism behind was then like leaving behind my youthful fundamentalism. Both conservatism and fundamentalism assume freedom to be the foundation of our lives, not something limited by environment or resources. Both assume that virtue can conquer the brute force of circumstances, and both condemn us to a world where grace must be earned rather than freely given. A view of life that comforts and flatters the successful but can only prove cruel to everyone else. A class-based politics acknowledges that we are bound in ways we do not choose, that we are constrained in ways that the exertion of our wills may never overcome. I thought that was a really well written and really well said, and I Thank think you. it gets to this idea about why this idea of like like empathy is always a dead end for when de like dealing right. with poverty or even mm -hmm. cultures that you may find alien or objectionable in either ways. Yeah. And the point is that it shouldn't matter. I shouldn't have to, Ember, as you said, I shouldn't have to like people to be in solidarity with them. Yeah. Right. I would I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> uh, yeah. I would say sort of conceptually, uh, the, the breakthrough for me really was my understanding of human agency. Just as I said, that, that we're bound in ways we don't choose. And I really don't think a lot of people who find themselves in tough circumstances in life, like actively set out to sabotage their lives, right? And if you've, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I've struggled with depression and things like that. And you just, if you have enough experiences as you go through life uh, that point to your own limitations, uh, to me, that was my own experiences in that regard really changed the way I view politics and, and other people. And, and you mentioned empathy, but really it's made me more compassionate to look at people and not have to be like, well, I'm going to overlook these shitty, horrible things they're doing to try to help them. It's because I don't, I just don't view them in those categories anymore. Like you're not constantly you know, evaluating right, exactly. people and trying to do some sort of means testing for their exactly. You know, morality. Ex exactly. Every bastard deserves better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not afraid to admit. You know, throughout my life, I've always been strong enough to never struggle with depression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And I hope that wasn't like so I, 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 I'm so just like I've always been admit. brave enough to be happy all the time. Yeah. And you know, like. It's not bad. I've, it's not bad to say that. Uh -huh. in, in my life, you know, it's not I'm pretty open about my life, about my struggles. You know, <laughs> in my life now, it's easy, but I've had problems before. Like, yeah, you know, I've had years where it's like I had too much sex. <laughs> I had years where, you know, like I was too smart in school. Heavy is the head that wears the yeah, crown. Yeah, exactly. Like, sometimes I have to answer too many DMs from women. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah. they I mean, they have to believe in meritocracy. They have to believe either that people are rewarded for their personal virtues, either talents or n not being racist by virtue of being the race that you're racist against, I guess. So that means you hit, literally can't be racist, so that makes you worthy. Because if you think about it as everyone deserves a decent amount 
uh, you know, a decent shot at life and a, a decent standard of living, regardless of ability or intelligence or even, you know, enlightenment, then, oh shit, we can't operate the economy as this grasping nightmare of, of capitalism that accumulates and exploits and destroys. Uh, it, that's the inherent implication of treating everybody as someone who deserves to be able to live decently. So you have to have means testing in order to justify the vast swaths of people who are going to be ill-served by capitalism. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Yeah. Thank uh, you for reading this book because I did not want to read it because I knew it would make me very mad. It, it Thank would. you so it much, would. Matt. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. J.D. Vince, you're what I like to call a hillbilly wannabe. <laughs> the type of motherfuckers <laughs> like you come back around the holler so we call a reversal. <laughs> J.D. Vance, J.D. Vance. You think you're better than me? J.D. JD Vance, I heard a lot of motherfucking talking from people like you, but one thing I ain't ever see as an operator was a motherfucking payday microloan store. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Sipman, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Where, where, where is the review of uh, Hillbilly L's? Uh, be it'll be coming out in Commonwealth. Pretty soon, in the next week or two, it should be hey, up on the Pete, site. Pete Common, yeah. I can't wait to read it. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. The book. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Bye. 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 You want to be somebody or not? I got an interview tomorrow, Mom. Otherwise, I... No, oh, you know me. I always land on my feet. you that I would do better. You, you always say that you're Not lying. always try. You've always got a reason. You're going to have to take responsibility or someone else what? is going to have to step in. Who? Ha who? You? Make us your excuse, JD. Everyone in this world is one of three kinds a good Terminator, a bad Terminator, and neutral. You're a good Terminator. Well, I wouldn't always. I had to learn. You could do it. All right, all right. It's Chapo Friends. Uh, you know, uh, a, a little bit, a little while ago, we did uh, a movie episode about an, about a sort of a Netflix original picture that's you know flagrant Oscar bait. If there even is going to be an Oscars this year, but it was the Trial of the Chicago Seven, which you know, at least in my opinion, was a very stupid movie made by a dumb asshole that nonetheless was pretty entertaining. It was like it was it was an enjoyable watch despite uh, it moved. all of the things that it had some momentum. Yeah. It it had some it had some sizzle, had some good performances. It was it was fun. It was entertaining despite being a sort of travesty of history and, and a reflection of the the creator's rather uh blinkered and idiotic worldview. Uh for today's episode we're giving you another Netflix original movie that is another flagrant, absolute, just begging for an Oscar for this year. I'm talking, of course, about Hillbilly Elegy. And to do this, to do a deep dive into the world of Hillbilly Elegy and J.D. Vance, uh, we've brought along, of course, Matt and Amber. But finally, long time coming, been chefing this up in the kitchen for a while, we are joined by, of course, the experts on all things Trill and Hill, the Trillbillies, Tom and Terrence. What's going on, fellas? Thanks for having us, Yeah, This is great. Lot. Just uh, sitting in Appalachia. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Guys, I, I just want to kick things off. I mean, obviously, I wanted to have, you know, a couple, a couple Kentucky boys on to bring some, like, some, some, real, some real juice, some real knowledge to this film about, you know, Appalachian life. Uh, but then I found out that probably less than five minutes of this movie actually takes place in Kentucky. So I don't know, I don't know why you guys are here. Can we get Murder Brian on the line? <laughs> or, or just Chris. He's from Southern, <laughs> Southern Ohio. Ninety five. Yeah, you got you got Chris in middle t- Middletown, Ohio. I got Chris. Of course, Matt lived in Cincinnati for a little bit. Uh, Chris is from South Ohio, and you know Amber from Indiana. So let me just start with Amber and the Trillbillies boys. Um, having seen this movie now, I mean, just what's, what is your? Uh, 
how do you think this captured the the culture of Appalachia and the holler? He's like as Appalachian as me. Like literally, he spent. <sighs> Well, he has, like, one summer that he or spent there or something, which is very common, but, like, it's very common. Okay, so there are two types of Midwesterners, and this is not a Chris Rock bit. But I think, <laughs> I think Matt will back me up on this. There's, like, North Country people, and then there's, like, people who come from Appalachian transplants that came in during, you know, industrial. The butternuts. Fish. Yes. Yeah. So I am from butternuts, so I have my entire father's family are all from Kentucky and they you know they moved to towns with other people from Kentucky and Tennessee to work in a paper mill or whatever um but I would never say I'm Appalachian like despite having spent like a lot of time there I really feel like he's stealing a little bit of valor he is stealing as much valor as all the kids I know who went to Marquette who went to the private Jesuit college in Marquette, Milwaukee, who said they were from Chicago. Yeah. From fucking Schaumburg. <laughs> Disgusting. And fucking, uh, 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 Aurora. Disgusting. It's, just, it's like, yeah, I'm from Chicago. Yeah, yeah, right. You live next to a shaky. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, there, there was this thing, like, when I was in college, it was sort of considered dead class to be from the South or to be from Kentucky or whatever. And then, like, five or six years after I graduated, it started being cool. So those same girls that were, like, no, I'm not from northern Kentucky. I'm from Cincinnati. All of a sudden became these sort of dainty southern ladies that like, you know, to drink <laughs> bourbon and like watch college football and shit. Wearing a giant hat to the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just really got into it. I, I do like how in the very first, though, like in the opening scenes, he gets his ass beat for being from Ohio. Yes, exactly. That's just a real problem <laughs> yeah. we don't talk about is anti-Ohio bigotry <laughs> among children. Uh, Midwestern bull- yeah. That's insane. The- also, if he's from the part of Ohio that I assume or that he insinuates that he's from, it is just the cusp. Like, it's it's different culturally because there's manufacturing and stuff, but like, like the, the person I was watching it with, he was like, like if we met someone from like 20 counties over, we would be like, huh. Look at you, Bumpkin. Please be my best friend. You're the most exotic person I have ever met. <laughs> like, when you're from a small place, like, new people are really exciting. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that, totally. For sure. Well, maybe they just recognized that this kid sucked. He did suck. And they suck. were bullying him because he sucked. Because it cannot be stressed enough. This kid fucking sucks yeah he's awful he's a <laughs> yes, selfish little yes, shit yes well that's the amazing thing is you're supposed to root for this kid in his life to get out of there but he exhibits no reason for you to root for him he does nothing he is in no for no moment does he sacrifice himself for anyone else he doesn't show any a uh, personality or spark or anything it's just you're the audience and so you identify with him and so of course you're rooting for him because he's just he's you he's a boring fucking dipshit like you are yeah. Well, Just okay, boring, he also believes asshole. himself, wait, Matt, he believes himself to be smart. He does this weird thing where he implies that he's smart because he's failing at school. And the teacher at one point pulls him aside yeah. and says, I know you're smarter than this, which is that's a lecture that teacher, I'm sure, gave 10 times a day. To various oh, sure. children. There yeah. was like nothing that just, indicated even that he was like smart and could excel. I just uh, my my letterbox review of Hillbilly Elegy was uh, Mima and Pep Pep uh, help use hill, hill folk wisdom to help huge fat pussy get internship at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this movie is about. Absolutely. That's what this movie is about. And I just like I, my, movie. I, get the, I was just saying, yes, this whole the whole conflict here is whether or not. He's going to be, frankly, a shitty son, leave behind his mother at what is just a heroin motel, which, by the way, he's surprised about. It's yeah. like, okay, the place, the place has the, yeah, lighting, got, get to that. the lighting of a fucking, you know, Edward Hopper painting so that he can go to an internship. This is just the story of a bad son. Yeah. How can you really trust a guy that won't piss clean for his mom? I mean, Jesus. How, yeah. yeah. how, how is that even a question? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I want my mom to lose her job. You fucking little sicko because you can't take a piss? Yeah, and, and no sense of like, oh, also, my economic well-being is bound up with hers. <laughs> yeah. Just by, just by way of comparing this to uh, Trial of the Chicago 7, though. 
unlike that movie, uh, th- th- this movie was is executive produced by J.D. Vance and directed by Ron Howard. So, I mean, like, Ron Howard uh, is just very, very middling director. He's made some good movies, but he mostly oh, makes... Oh, God, absolute movies. fucking... Just sort of like paint by, paint by numbers is, schlock. No talent hack. Yeah. And this is this is the worst kind of bad movie because it's it's offensively bad in like a number of reasons for a number of reasons that we'll get into. But at no point does like the utter catastrophe of the filmmaking or acting really get to the point of being fun or funny or like truly absurd or idiotic. It's just it's mind bogglingly dull. There's not a single moment of like tension. Like the as Amber explained, the entire fucking like engine of this movie is is this fucking Yale Law School asshole going to make his interview with the big firm? Get uh, Spoiler alert, he does. There's no conflict. At no point does he, like, actually have to choose between his, his family roots and, like, a career fucking, I don't know, yeah, at the Heritage Foundation. But because this is about J.D. Vance, I just wanted to share, uh, J.D. Uh, hopped back on my radar recently. I mean, we've talked about his book when it came out. But he had a pretty fire tweet at the beginning of this month that I think helps sets up, you know, the sort of mindset of the guy who made this fucking movie and book. Uh, he says here, as a parent of young children and a nationalist who worries about America's low fertility, I can say with confidence that daylight savings time reduces fertility by at least 10 percent. I mean, does this guy just like not like fucking when it's too dark out or too light out? I don't get it. What's he on about? I mean, I'm going to take the counter on this and say that daylight saving sign is a scourge upon uh, our planet, and uh, we need to get rid of it. That's why Indiana doesn't recognize it. No, we fucking don't, because fuck you. That's why also we are an agricultural state, and we know that now they make the farm equipment with headlights on it. It doesn't matter if it's dark. It's got lights on it right on the fucking thing. Just, just, it's going to. I think like, like the the beginning, like the opening scene of this movie has like the funniest fucking part that like totally sets up everything that comes after it, and it opens up in Jackson, Kentucky, in 1999, and it opens with like there's a sort of a, a radio preacher in the background, and he's talking about how, you know, in this great and resplendent land of ours, some some feel that hope and prosperity is out of their reach, and like this is sort of uh, juxtaposed with images of sort of like toothless Mimas sitting on a porch and on a rocking chair listening to the radio and then young JD the sort of like uh, adolescent JD Vance hops out of the uh, hops out of his grandma's house and bikes on down to the swimming hole and then in voiceover narration of JD Vance in the present he says people ask me where I'm from and I say Ohio because that's where I'm from but that's only part of my story uh, I also spent some time with my cousins in Kentucky, and that's where I feel the most at home. He spent, like, one summer vacation there. And by the way, I had to make a note to myself, there is not even cousin magic in this movie. It's just no his parents. No he has that's even no lamer. friends. It's not like he was wiling out with his cousins in the holler going to the fishing hole. He was just alone by himself being a huge pussy. And then he's at the swimming <laughs> hole, and he's just like, this is where I feel most at home, here in the hollers of Kentucky. And the actual Kentucky kids, like, beat the shit out of him. They're like, you fucking pussy from a Yeah, it's like, where, where, where is this feeling home? <laughs> you know what? You don't so actually feel under- home at there. That's why I realized this is the movie. At the, at the end of the movie, it's like, he's saying that because the narrative, it's a college admissions essay. Yes. Yeah. He's just trying yeah. to get into school. He's trying to impress the audience like they're the fucking uh, they're the entrance exam board or the law school guy that he's going to the job interview for. It's like, that's just part of my story. It's like, bitch, why do I care what's your fucking story? I don't know you. Yeah. Also, there's nothing at the end that suggests, and that man grew up to yeah. <laughs> nothing. To do anything, to write this book. He went that's to the, the military. He, yes, that was he, his accomplishment. He, his accomplishment is that he wrote about it. His, he, is a, his, he is worth caring about because he got a book published that somebody made a movie about. What, that's it. You what know, that's what else was going on needs. in Jackson, Kentucky, right around the same time, and, they, and like this is the thing that made it out? Fucking Steven Seagal was floating around doing fire down below, like, you know, <laughs> paying people money to, like, let me blow up your fucking truck sitting in your yard, that kind of shit. Uh, next of Kin, I think, was Hell yes. there with Patrick Swayze. Yeah. Hell yes. And Hell yes. Somewhere a young Sturgill Simpson was budding down there, but JD in the swimming hole is the thing that, you know, sort of, <laughs> that's this what we place need to is care about. Is this dork getting purple nurpled so, by his cousin? <laughs> Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> So the real collar kids beat him up, and like this, this is the moment at four minutes eight seconds into the film in which my mind completely checked out. 
So it's like young JD is getting bullied by holler teens, and then old older JD in narration says, things can get pretty tough down in Jackson in a heartbeat, but mama and papa taught me that you never start a fight, but you always finish one. And then it just shows him getting his ass kicked again. And he's just like, <laughs> yeah, my kinfolk says that even if, you, even if you lose a fight, your people will always back you up. And then the film shows his grandparents <laughs> saving him from getting beaten up and humiliated further, which is like, the, this is this is the story of like jd vance being a huge pussy like that that is yeah. that is what this movie is about yeah. the dynamic Wait i found really weird and culturally inaccurate as well J- not just because like the bullying thing but like when they were shocked when uh his papa like punched the kid it's like none of my grandparents we- we're all just old people are just allowed to hit you like you are terrified of old people because they're not they are not bound by the laws of man past a certain age in Kentucky. They will just fucking hit you and no one cares. And it's like, what is this like, you know, chocolate war, wild man's land, like tyranny of like teen boys that supposedly exists there? This is it was not believable was my point. In some ways, it was like the passion of J.D. Like he just gets tormented and has yeah. his ass kicked throughout the entire thing. Yeah. So I, and so I really did wonder, like, in the licensing for this book, or, yeah, for, like, when he sold the rights to it, if he had some sort of, like, clause in there or something that said, like, I have to be the protagonist. It di- Like, it didn't make sense. When I saw the trailer for this movie, I thought that it would be a drama between Amy Adams' character and Glenn Close's character. And I was like... Yeah, me too. Right, yeah. With, mm-hmm. yeah, with J.D. as kind of an onlooker, as a sort of innocent bystander in the whole thing. But I was shocked as the movie progressed. Like he's the main character, the most boring guy in yeah. the world. Yeah, a little but turd. It's Who weird. Cares it's, about him. But they stripped out the politics of most of it. I mean, this did. This movie did have an ideological message. It had an agenda. It was very subtle and very vague and even squishy in its own right. But, it, but by stripping out a lot of the politics of the book, they just left the characters, and so it just was disjointed. It was very bizarre. I don't know. I I found it to be the very structure bizarre. is insane. Like it's, yeah, it's it's this oh, the, Cuisinart the, 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 of yeah. flashbacks within flashbacks with no narrative forward momentum at all. Oh, you I, lose I don't track know. of what's the going on, except that they smear all of the pa- the uh, <laughs> flashbacks in sepia. Like but, literal sepia. That's how you yeah. know this is olden times. The, the sheen of this movie and like the color palette is exactly the same as Simple Jack from Tropic Thunder. It's like <laughs> it's the exact same fucking color palette. It envelope. really was. And I, I forget someone said it on Twitter. Someone said it on Twitter, and it's just it's not an original thought, but like Glenn Close has been around for ages, and she's been like a god tier actor. Like you know, someone who is even if oh, the yeah. movie sucks is always good in. You know, and like this movie was her monkey's paw wish to win an Oscar where she's like, I, I just I need an Oscar this year. They gave it to a fucking British TV actress and I was supposed to win it for the wife. She's like, I'll do anything to get an Oscar. Monkey's paw curls. And she looks like some sort of like gnome smoking New Paul's Newports. <laughs> I got to say, though, the styling and the yeah. aging are yeah. the one thing that I have to give credit to. Like, down to the glasses. My mama has those big fucking plastic pink lens crafter glasses. Uh, she, she was the only entertaining part of it. I would have yeah. watched an entire movie with just Glenn Close's yeah. mama. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amber, you're right. You're right in, like, the 4X, like, Walmart faded glory shirt over, yeah, like, yeah. This, like, the spandex waisted jeans. <laughs> everything. Everything. Yeah. And, and the yeah. perm, because, like, never going to condition that hair, but can't miss a perm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's one hundred percent. And you know, wow. and, and and the thing is, like, uh, Terrence, you're right that the movie the movie soft sells JD Vance's actual politics, and the book was very political, and like it was very well reviewed. But like, I don't think people should lose tr- sight of the fact that like this was sort of, I guess, what they call a literary memoir that was very well reviewed in places like the New York Times and elsewhere. <laughs> but the thing is, like, this this isn't just the story of some kid who, like, had a pr- semi-fucked up childhood and, like, made good and is telling sort of an inspiring story. I mean, this guy is a dyed-in-the-wool member of, like, a, a, a conservative legal movement and, like, is ideologically driven in everything he does. I mean, he's on Fox News every other night of the week. Like, so, I mean, there's a political valence to all of this, but, like, also just from a literary perspective, I've been exposed to so many of these type of memoirs that I feel like I have a pretty good radar for what is literary exaggeration. And I feel like there's a lot of it going on here where he's trying to make like 
his childhood and family life seem a lot more precarious and fucked up than I imagine it actually was. And like, you know, if we take it at face value, like, yeah, his, his, his home life was a little bit fucked up, but like in the grand scheme of things in the sort of tapestry of American life, is it that fucked up or crazy? So yeah, like I, I just think like we'll, we'll get into it, but like a, a lot of this in, in, in the book and the film felt like it's either he's exaggerating or like the stories he's telling just aren't that impressive. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah. uh, one time me and my friends uh, like got drunk and did some mild property damage. It's just yeah. like, well, I mean, okay, like no, it's all dork shit. It's like it's a nerd bitch, hall monitor nerd trying to make his childhood look interesting in any way. He yeah. shoplifted a calculator. <laughs> that was the best part. He, like, he, like he, the moment where he, like, he could have turned to a life of crime and like going to prison and shit is when he shoplifts the Texas Instruments calculator so he can do his fucking homework on time. No, there, this, this, this child was never going to be anything other than a pleated pant lanyard bitch. Like, it's born into him. Yeah. There's the, any attempt to try to make it look like, oh boy, it could have gone any way for old JD. It's like, no, it could not have. And, and that was the essential thing about this movie is that like there there was no tension or feeling of uh, uh like drama or anything about this question of will young JD make it or not or will will adolescent or will like young man JD get the job at the law firm because it's like of course he fucking will like there, there's no chance his life is going to turn out any differently 100% the little the first little like outburst he has at the dinner table did not happen <laughs> Yeah. About redneck? About the word redneck? We don't Yeah, like word. he was so offended by the term <laughs> redneck. Yeah. First, okay. Yeah, opening <laughs> scene, he finds out his mother OD'd on heroin, goes back to the table, is like, well, I better finish this dinner. This is for me. I better rub elbows. Because he's a piece of shit, by the way. And then all of a sudden, he, he really has this is. weird kind of like national pride, and he's like, we don't use that word. Yes, we do. Do everyone yeah. use it? Like cops, it's on bumper stickers. Right. There's not even a generation of people for whom redneck is some kind of a slur. <laughs> it's very weird. Yeah. So like, like, er, like early in the movie, like it, it, it jumps forward in time, and it's now 2011. We get we get a little we get a little snatch of a young JD in the holler back in 1997 in the fire down below era. And then it jumps ahead 14 years in the future. And, you know, JD, he's growing up. He's a hard worker. He's a slop jockey by night at a local restaurant to pay for Yale Law School by day. And he says the road to Yale Law is rocky, but there's only one way through. So like, he's already this hyper ambitious guy and he's got a girlfriend and he's got like a he's on his way to a career in D.C. And then so he's going to this like Yale Law School event where you're supposed to like, yeah, rub elbows with all these partners at a firm to get you an internship, to get you on the way. Uh, climb that ladder on the road to success and he's just like i think he really plays up the idea that like they all there's two different kinds of white wine and he's just like y'all i don't even know about this y'all got mountain dew or something and he's all like freaked out because like he doesn't know what forks to use and i'm just saying like i don't i just i don't find it credible that he could have gotten all the way to he's lying and uh, been, he's and he's been lying. that fucking like perplexed by like a wine selection why are there so many fucking forks usha if he was that perplexed by that shit, he wouldn't have He's been in that position. He's lying in such a way that is intended to appeal to, like, pitying liberal audiences because he knows it's what they want to hear. It's this Just horrible like they want to hear him get offended thing. by redneck. Yeah. It's they want to hear him be like, no, that's my lived identity. You can't say that word. Yeah, that's because we want to hear. It's the same thing as, <laughs> I, I bring this up every time, but, like, the arugula thing when, like, Barack Obama had arugula and it was, like, on a, in a salad or a sandwich or something, and then on Fox News, people were like, ah, "Arugula? Uh, is Middle America really going to elect an arugula eater?" And it's like, we know what lettuce is. <laughs> We've heard of lettuce. <laughs> like, it drives home at every point just how backwards he is. But it doesn't work. I don't know. It, maybe it's because of the actor they got, or because it's just false, as you said, Will. Like, it's just literary embellishment. But they're just constantly driving that home, like the fork thing. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, um, honestly, the movie is about a guy whose disability is that his grandparents are Appalachian. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's yes. It. Oh, yes. my God. Does this mean I have a disability? I, can I start talking about spoons now? <laughs> yeah. You, Everybody, you can get uh, extra time on your spoons. SATs to be a fucking hillbilly. <laughs> yeah. You, nobody, you can't just be a regular white person because that means you're bad. Yeah. So in order to get audience buy-in, you have to be some subcategory. Yeah. 
that has been oppressed, An even if you white. didn't personally suffer any of the oppression. Right. Like when he had, yeah. I bet that he did have that meeting, and I bet he noticed the wines, and I bet he noticed the forks. And you know what he probably thought? He thought, wow, I bet the hillbillies I grew up with would be baffled yes. by this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He would say, yeah. he he would say my mama like and papa wouldn't know, how to, exactly. wouldn't know what to do. But that doesn't give him like a little narrative arc, a little emotional thing of like, and something to overcome. So he makes it like he was actually intimidated by it <laughs> and not just imagining what his relatives would have thought. <laughs> right, right. So as, as Amber pointed out, he's, he's, at this, he's at this posh Yale Law dinner, and he gets a phone call from his sister. By the way, the sister, they totally went, we want a Jennifer Lawrence type. Also, the sister, yeah. there's a weird, I, I don't mean, Tom, Tom texted me this afterwards, and we were talking about this. There's, there's almost kind of a weird sexual thing between him and his sister at, some, at several points. They're looking at each other like, I, I mean, I, I know that that oh, probably t- wasn't. Terrence, t- another stereotype, another stereotype. <laughs> Here disgusting. we go. Here we go. <laughs> well, they didn't really have the, uh, the, the, his actual love interest. It, it didn't really um, sparkle. She was just like this very like beautiful kind of woman who no. would, uh, you know, answer the phone and then hold it uh, like, Six inches from her face, so that it didn't obscure her perfect bone structure or whatever. Like right. You didn't care about his future wife at all, but you did care about the sister. No, not the slightest. Type. Well, his right. sister, the, the the girlfriend, stands in for the life that he's pursuing. You know, this put together cosmopolitan lady yeah. from outside the holler, right? Who who who's, she's trying to impress, impress and keep interested in him, and she just she represents the whole world that he's searching for and you're supposed to think she's cool because that's what he wants she's boring. But once again why should i care about this turd <laughs> or be in him being with this boring lady yeah this boring uh there, the lady from a crate and barrel commercial there was that one weird scene where he's like at the barbecue or something in in middletown and she calls and he's like my mom's od'd again and she's like oh could i come like help out or something and he just gets weirdly aggressive with her like yeah you wouldn't fucking under like just like just like preemptive like, you wouldn't fucking understand <laughs> Also, I feel like, I mean, maybe this is projecting myself, but I feel like everyone has had a family, like having a family member with an addiction problem is not like a super rare thing. Right. Anywhere. (laughs) Kind of anywhere. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you're rich, it's benzos. And if you're poor, it's like heroin or meth. Like, so he's at this posh Yale law dinner. And he gets a call from his sister that his mom just OD'd on heroin. And he's like, oh, but it's job interview week. Oh, do I have to come home? And she's like, well, yeah, your, your mom almost your died. Mom she's back on snacks. So <laughs> and then he's like, oh, God, how am I going to think about the forks now? And then he, he goes back and sits down. And then like then you get the scene where like one of the law partners is like, well, you're from Appalachia. What's it like to go back and talk to all those rednecks? And he's like, uh, we, we we don't we don't use that term anymore, which is. <laughs> <laughs> Such absolute bullshit. But then, bullshit. I, but then it gets to, then it gets to what it was my a, one of my absolute my absolute favorite line in the movie is like he's he's sort of being pseudo interviewed at this dinner and they're like so uh, J D like tell us about yourself and he goes well you know like I'm I'm from I'm from Kentucky but actually Ohio and then he goes and then I joined the Marines and served in Iraq quote it was a great experience. <laughs> That's what it really? was. was it? it wasn't the million dead. It was a good, it was a resume building opportunity. It was a chance for personal growth for me, the fat, disgusting center of the universe. But Matt, this is why you are absolutely correct in that this whole movie or the whole book was based on a call like it's, it's a developed yep. college admissions it, essay where it's like yep. I, it was an amazing experience. I met lots of interesting people and learned a lot. <laughs> That's why I you should them. consider me for this internship. But yep. another friend brought up a thing, and you can tell me if you agree with this or not but one of the ways that this doesn't actually translate is that okay so the book was intended for a bunch of liberals that want a kind of um you know a a bootstraps hillbilly archetype to say like look well he did it so the rest of them should really get off their asses the movie had the tone of like some of the more expensive like christian family dramas or like a hallmark movie so it's for a totally different audience. So it feels really weird with that stuff jammed in there. Well, because the movie was made for someone like my mama. You're right. Yeah. It was the movie was very strange as filmmaking. It is very like it's almost like they tried to do too much. There's two films here. 
there's what I call the Garden State plot, where he has to go back home, and it's even a rom com kind of because there's a scene at the <laughs> yeah. end where With like no shows rom or com, but yes, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's that in that whole that whole sequence in the movie. Fifty percent of the movie is this whole sequence. It all occurs in 24 hours. I, I mean, like I I didn't even think about this until yep. afterwards. But this is everything that JD does in 24 hours. Drives yeah. to Ohio, goes to visit his mom in the hospital, goes to a barbecue where he sort of has the weird sexual thing with his sister, takes his mom to rehab, which fails, takes his mom to get her shit from Ray's house, and then almost, you know, uh, Again. kicks his ass. Right, Ray was right. ready ready to come with it. <laughs> yeah. Goes and visits his sister at Payless Shoes, takes his mom to a hotel where she tries to shoot um, up, and then he and then he just fucking lets a cold turkey withdraw. For. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then... And then drives back to New Haven, does the weird rom-com thing, and then makes... I mean, like, think of all the movies and TV shows you've seen that occur in 24 hours. You know what I mean? Like, there's there's a pace, and there's a, a feeling that you're in the there's morning, the afternoon. Exactly. Yeah. You know that you're in the nighttime now, and, like, is he going to make it? What's going to happen? It was just, like, yeah. the way Why it did... whipsawed back and forth, it was just so disjointed. Why didn't they start out that way, either, is the other thing that I was thinking. I'm like, what if they just started out with, like, I have 24 hours... To get to this, you know, interview. Yeah, because at least then cut out be all the other and then, shit, and then backtrack to like backtrack to like here's what happened, here's where I am, I'm this way, you know, and then just keep going back to him in the car being tense, ha- develop some conflict, some tension, because the entire time I was like, why do, what's, where's the conflict? Yeah, it, it's so insanely inertial. It's like there's no forward <laughs> narrative momentum. It's no. stunning. No, because, yeah, yeah no. you could have done this thing, 24-hour clock at the beginning, boom, yeah. set the stakes. He's got to get his mom. And then you uh, periodically have flashbacks over the course of it. Instead, it's just this, this, the flashbacks are, are put in equally with the actual narrative, so there's no sense of anything. It's all happening no. simultaneously. Who directed, like being, who directed Crank? Because I'm stuck in time like Philly Pilgrim. Who directed Crank or uh, Shoot yes, Up? Neville, uh, Neville <laughs> and Taylor. Or the sad Neville Dean and Taylor. Yes. <laughs> Right, have right. to like go around a bunch of like fent heads and jug hooters as like Howard Ratner <laughs> or, getting your uh, or, OD'ing mom to a uh, to her uh, to the halfway house. Or even if this, been my, if this had been my cinematic vision, I would have went Warriors trying to get to Coney Island. Yeah, Coney Island is Middletown, and like in New Jersey, when he's at that gas station, you run into the Italian mafia and they like rough him up a little yeah. bit there at the gas station. Then he's got to keep going though. If there are avenues they could have taken for I'm us imagining... to at least have some tension and speed and movement. I'm imagining the TV show 24 where it's like what you're about to see takes place in real time. JD has 24 <laughs> hours to stop his mom from doing heroin again before getting back for a law firm interview. Oh, no. He dropped her off at the heroin motel. <laughs> right. Which, again, yeah. even the sister says, yeah, well, there's I, a motel the she sometimes drops- stays at. Why do you think she stays there? Oh, she Not- has this guy who takes care of her named Amber- Bobo. He wears a big purple suit. Like, <laughs> Not just the heroin hotel. He flushes her drugs and lets her withdraw. Just cold turkey. Just yeah. like, fuck. Sorry, That's mom. That's not dangerous. Yeah. That'll be fine. <laughs> well, and, and he, yeah. they, be the back, he even had the option there. of getting methadone on the way out of the fucking, th- like, also, most people do, like, leave heroin, like, like, outpatient treatment. Like, they come in, they have their therapy, they get their methadone, they go home. Like, what they actually need is someone to watch them while they feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> they can take care of them this, and make sure they don't very, do heroin again. Maybe we can talk about this later, but I thought that scene was very fascinating. I mean, there's a lot about the movie in that scene. Well, we'll get there. But, like, as Matt alluded to, like, the movie is trapped in this incredibly led in like, narrative architecture where it just flits back between, like, an A plot, which is young JD being, like, a big fat pussy while with an unstable <laughs> mother and, like, a grandmother who takes care of him. And then, like, and then the B plot of, like, young man JD spending one day in Middletown, Ohio. Um, but, like, you know, we, we get some flashbacks of, like, you know, Amy Adams. We get, like, hints of her being unstable, which is basically... Her freaking out after JD like cl- like is like knocks something over like a big dumb klutz. First he breaks some Easter eggs, then he knocks over some like a tray of football cards, yeah. and then she has a meltdown where she like attacks him in the street. They're also all shocked every time she gets mad, and obviously it goes into like darker places. But it's like again, maybe this is a cultural difference. But like the first time she screams at him, people are like, "Mom!" or like. But parents scream at you like that's what that's I mean, 
roughly 50% of parenting. Like, I, it was just like this very weird thing where it's like, what culturally completely separate from my experience, little microcosm, did you grow up in where, at least in the initial scenes, the early Amy Adams, the single mom who is under a lot of stress, doesn't snap once or twice a week and fucking yell at you. Yeah. And this people don't just go, by- well, she'll, she'll get over it. She's- but this movie is made by and for people who don't do that, who have been trained not to do that, and who see that <laughs> as not like part of living in a stressful life, but as some sort of eruption of instability, bad manners, and trauma. And also, more importantly, they have to play up the trauma of this to make this guy's boring-ass childhood some sort of battle over adversity. Yeah. Him, his mom yelling at him has to have to yeah. take a place of, like, surviving a school shooting because there is no actual drama <laughs> in his boring-ass yeah. life. Right. Very yeah. little Which bad was a straight to line to heart. Which was a straight line to Yale. He was a fucking nerd. He was a nerd. He was locked in from, a, from the jump, and he was going to end up where he ended up, barring some sort of catastrophe, which he avoided. So there's nothing really dramatic or interesting about his triumph over adversity. They have to make it appear that way. They have to give people in the scene uh, uh, signaling the audience that, oh, you should think this is a big deal. It's the lifetime television for women version of Tree of Life. Yeah, exactly, which is a movie that actually makes does scenes that really feel like childhood memories. Yeah, yeah which Whereas are not every necessarily scene traumatizing, in this just is another an yeah. piece of Hallmark bullshit. Every childhood well, scene... Every childhood scene is a parable. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. pretty much every one of them, anyways, ends with some sort of moral lesson. Whether it's because the, yeah. he's telling them to his fucking admissions ad- uh, counselor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that this is you said. Somebody said it was like this is like a, one of those Christian movies, like one of those movies where uh, yeah. you know Kurt feature Cameron, films for families uh, or something uh, arises over his pornography addiction, <laughs> and it is. It is a Christian <laughs> m- mainstream film where Jesus is replaced with a job with a law firm. Like that's the thing that <laughs> redeems you from from the horrors of your life and and, and your uh, your travails is the hope of a nice fat upper middle class or uh, rich existence yeah, instead of Jesus. Yeah. You know what I found right. weird too, and we might be digressing too much. There's virtually no mention whatsoever of religion. Right. Which yeah, that's true because it's been replaced by ambition. And also, yes, he converted to Catholicism for professional reasons, basically to get in with like the fucking first things crowd, and the it like in his thirties or something. And it's like <laughs> you're not going to mention. Like I, I find it incredibly hard to believe that anyone with a mama and papa doesn't have some pretty formative church stories. Well, he doesn't believe in any of that. It doesn't register with him. It's not what matters. What matters is selling himself to the people on the East Coast he's trying to impress and ingratiate himself with. Yeah. So yeah. what does religion have to do with that? What do they care about religion? Because he knows they find it, at best, a charming rural eccentricity, if not like a, a, a moral uh, uh, deformation. And for him, it means nothing because none of it abs- adhered to him. Mm. So, you know, like you said, like there, there, there's a scene where uh, he does car pranks with his mom and then she like swats him. She's like, no, shut up, you little bastard. She calls and then he him jumps a little badass, which like... is the funniest. I actually doubled over. There's oh, nothing she funnier. Him up and calling she's him like, fat you little fat ass. Like calling your tubby little male child a fat ass is the funniest. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I, I'm not endorsing it. It's I'm just saying it was hilarious, and it was the only time during the movie I laughed. Uh, there's one other part that so, I yeah. laughed at that we'll talk about later. So, uh, so like, yeah, his, his mom swats him in the back seat of the car, and then he like jumps out of a moving car and like runs into the nearest house, and he's like, "My mom is trying to kill me! My mom is trying to kill me!" And then the cops show up, and they're like, "Ma'am, ma'am, step away from the large son. Step away from your round boy." <laughs> and then like they put her in the squad car, and then it's just like, "Y'all are brutal." Uh, we have, we have me. a uh, we have a 452 Caleb situation. Uh, bring back up. <laughs> Four alarm Caleb situation. So, you know, it's like it's all like, oh, will you get the internship or not? And the, here's here's another thing that I don't know if you guys clocked. Young JD at several points in this movie really is into watching CNN. And like he's like, Grandma, yeah, don't press. turn off yes. the TV. I want to yeah. hear Al Gore. I'm, I'm listening up, to Al, so I'm his, listening there, to Al scene, Gore. Th- yeah, he wants, to, he wants to hear Al Gore and Monica Lewinsky on TV. There's a scene where him and Glenn Close, his mama, they're chilling in the living room. And she's watching Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And this little bitch is like, can we put on Meet the Press? And then his what? mama was like, no, I love Arnold. Yeah, and you know what? And this then is, she this says, is, this is the thing, never put a better movie in your movie. Whole, like, life, 
Exactly. Never put a better movie in a bad movie. But then, like, Glenn Close explains to him that she has this whole half-baked life philosophy based around Terminator 2, where she's like, uh, you can either be a good Terminator, a bad Terminator, or a neutral Terminator. And I was like, what? <laughs> but, you can but wait, that what? More. There That's are no neutral all. Terminators. But also, sometimes you become a different Terminator, and you can be a different type of Terminator on a day-to-day basis. You can change. So, so really, they're, really well, actually, uh, we live in a morally nothing. gray world. <laughs> So I don't know why the Terminators are really necessary for this. That's almost like, like I'm sorry, that the moral framework dog wolf uh, thing from uh, American Sniper. But instead, it's like, so you got your wolves and your sheep dogs and your sheep. Sometimes the sheep can turn into a wolf. But sometimes the wolves will become sheep. And the thing about the sheep dog is he's always going to be a sheep dog. But on a weekend, sometimes he turns into a wolf. <laughs> yeah. OK. So by the way, I just want to say Al Gore is more of an actual redneck than J.D. Vance. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. But I mean, yeah, like the the moral universe of the Terminators are that like you can either be a good Terminator or a bad Terminator. And that's pretty much set. Once you're on that track, there's no variation there. It's not like Papa was sometimes he was a bad Terminator, but then sometimes he helped John Connor. It's like, no, you're either you're either good or a bad. You're operating from your programming. No matter what you're being, you're being, you're programmed. That's the whole thing about Terminators. You don't get to choose. Yeah, there's some confusing Calvinist mix-ups here about, like, you're set in stone, but also there's bootstraps, but also the, it's just a... Oh, it's it's completely incoherent in that regard. There's several different, like, one of the, you know, vignettes, the parable of the end, the mamma looks at JD and says, um, family's the only thing worth the goddamn. But then, like, you know, again, I'm jumping ahead, but, like, towards the end, he basically tells his family to fuck off. I, I don't know, it just, it, it never yeah. can land on... What well, family really... matters to the extent that you can use it to get into Yale and to get <laughs> yes. the internship. <laughs> yes. That's, what fam- right. that's why family matters, because it's grist for the mill of your personal fucking ambition. Yeah, and to right. start And to start a new one with a woman who uh, you can be ashamed of your old one with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you can improve on. Hey, look, I, I, me and my cheekbone wife and our, our little well-behaved uh, non-fat children... I uh, have no, I've solved seen, the f- the family problem. I've seen his kids. They they take after JD. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she is really be- like both the actress and the 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 wife are actually like really beautiful. And there is sort of a like, how'd you manage that? I mean, whatever. I guess people just sort of like pair off in Yale or whatever. But yeah, uh, here's the thing that occurred to me. Like it, it, during the flashbacks, it's like uh, so uh, the the grandfather dies and then they go to the funeral and you see Amy Adams like pop a pill in in the car on the way to uh, the funeral and then like the next scene she's like stealing pills from her job as a nurse and then putting on roller skates and just like careening through a burn unit like high as shit. <laughs> I and I was just, I was just too, in the movie like on there's no real. That's not how opioids work. You want to take a nap. You're not. I've never been roller skating opioids yeah. fucked up. She, so she gets fucked up on pills like really quickly. And it just occurred to me that like you don't really see any like progression of her falling apart. It's just you see her pop a pill once. And then it's just like, oops, I got fired from my job at the hospital for fucking uh, doing doing a doing a grind on like a fucking ER bed when laughing my ass off. Oh, he, he assassinates her character. And then in the present day, like a big part of the plot is like his mom not having insurance or being able to like get a bed in rehab or like seek drug treatment. And I just got to say, I'm really glad those experiences informed his later career working for the Heritage <laughs> Foundation or whatever he did in D.C. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Like it, it strikes me that a lot of the flashbacks like like Amber, you're right. It really does assassinate the character of his mother because like a lot of the plot is about how like he keeps flitting about from like boyfriend to boyfriend there's a new stepfather. There's a new guy in the picture every day. And a lot of it just struck me as like JD's like real anger and like rage at his mother for not being like the, the sort of like a, a perfect like, you know, nuclear family uh, home homemaker. And, you know, like it just it's just his anger at her for like having boyfriends and not having like a stable family background. But I will say um, when she does marry a guy from her job, uh, JD gets inaugurated into a world of cool kids. Because yeah. he has, like, a cool <laughs> stepbrother. And, like, the first thing his stepbrother does is, like, first of all, his new stepdad has a framed poster of Casino by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, I saw so, that. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. His new stepdad is really nice to him, too, and immediately welcoming. And he just lucked into a cool stepdad and a cool stepbrother. <clears throat> and instead of, like, being, like, oh, cool, he's, like, irate or whatever. And he's, like, a square and a bummer. It sucks, man. He sucks so bad. 
and it's like his, his like his his new stepdad, and like you know th- this is played in the movie like it's fucking Oliver Twist or something, but like he's got a cool stepdad who grows weed, and they have video games and shit. So it's just like, well, what what more do you need to grow up in America? Not much. And then his new stepbrother is like, hey, want to get high, man? And he's like, no, he'd rather watch CNN and then fuck up his mom's piss test. Okay, like he said, he says it's a gateway this, though? drug. Yeah, he says a gateway <laughs> drug. He calls it a gateway drug, little <laughs> fucking dork. But like, and whip it. Okay, he's so like, to whip it. Well, he should be. Those those should be. You get the death penalty <laughs> for doing those. Um, but like, okay, so like you alluded to it earlier, Tom. But like, there's a whole thing where like his mom needs him to piss in a cup for his for her job, and like, did he smoke weed with his friend, and is that's why he didn't want to pee in the cup because he knew his piss would fuck up her test? Because like, that's never resolved. He never admits to smoking weed with his stepbrother, nor and then he does give the piss. But then, like, I guess it doesn't come back dirty. So I guess he didn't smoke weed. Like, it, that was just never very well explained, the weed smoking aspect of this movie. Right. <laughs> but, like, a little bitch, like, even if he, I assume he had clean piss, he was like, no, I'm not going to pee in a cup for my mom so she can yeah. keep her job. Because I, I, I want to teach her a lesson about Who being responsible. Who do you think buys the fucking potato chips, you fat little shit? Right, right. <laughs> this is, you know, this is the thing about the book that is consistent with the movie. The book is basically just slandering his mother. And, like, the very first episode we ever did on our show, we just called it J.D. Vance is a snitch. Because that's all this book is. He's just laying out all of his family's dirty laundry and secrets. And But this does get into the politics of J.D. Vance. Um, and, and this was, I think, preserved somewhat in the movie. I mean, he, he does share that sort of same view with Charles Murray. I mean, like, I was telling Tom this the other day. I was kind of doing some research we we had gone on citations needed and, and we were talking about Hillbilly LG and I was kind of doing some research and I found this essay that Charles Murray wrote in the early 90s called The Coming White Underclass. It was published in yeah. the Wall Street Journal. And I mean, and if you read that essay, it is like the seed of Hill, Hillbilly LG, what eventually came the memoir. And the whole idea, like he says it in there, illegitimacy is the number one social problem of our time. You know, single white mothers, basically. And and he basically says yeah. that if you if you want to be a single mi- white mother, if you want to raise a child on your own, you should be shunned from society and literally have your child. He proposed cutting welfare to fund orphanages for the children of single mothers. I mean, like, so this I think this gets into the- <laughs> and Clinton kind of fell in line with that. Yeah, no, yeah. I think this is kind of the under. I think this is kind of the sort of subversive message. You know, like the, the kind of message at the root of. Both the book and, and maybe it's a little more subtle in the film, but basically, yeah, like single white mothers are the, you know, the epitome of just you know, social evil. <laughs> well, and you know what they did um, to, I mean, to my experience growing up when I wrote about this is that like they did, of course, have like TAMP checks and all of these things that you could get if you like myself had a single teen mom um, and a single income. And then they transitioned away from that and transitioned towards child support enforcement laws. So. You had tons of men, and there was a big campaign against deadbeat dads. Yeah. yeah. And that did not distinguish between people who were, like, mentally ill, people who couldn't get a job, people who wouldn't pay, because there's no way to distinguish between that. Because it's just, it's so much easier to be like, oh, you have to be a nuclear family, and you have to be tied to this other person, no matter what their problems are forever, rather than just fund children's welfare broadly universally every kid gets these resources and, and these checks and everything yeah and like it it was it really spiked the prison population i mean my dad was in and out of jail all the time like for shit like that and it's like the only thing that it ended up doing was giving my mom another job which was tracking down my dad yeah. to ask for money he may or may not have had at the right. moment it yeah. didn't it doesn't work like, yeah, but it's cheaper. Have you considered that? Because you try, <laughs> you get the money out of the dads instead of out of the the, uh, the, the budget. Bears, so yeah. you save you save an item, a line item there. So yeah. it's just smart. It's just smart, uh, smart policy making. <laughs> so as things move along in a a rather, uh, it's both a rapid clip, but what feels like it takes forever in the present day plot line, we get another flashback, and like this is where it gets really embarrassing because it's like trying to show how. As we said earlier, JD's life could have taken another path. You know, he falls into with the bad crowd. And by the bad crowd, it's just like a couple teenage kids who like drink a beer. And then they're like, hey, let's let's go do some let's go break into where I work and fuck up some shit. And he's like, Okay, we can take my grandma's car. 
and like that like that is the height of his like teenage misdeeds is like he like he fucks up his grandma's car doing some hijinks with his friends and that's when glenn close mama glenn close is like i'm taking you away from your mom you know you need a you need a uh, like a, a strong hand to guide your young male life so i'm gonna I'm, you, you stop hanging out with those loser friends and start applying yourself and then the, there's a funny scene where he's like on the front porch with his friends and like mama rolls up and she does anti-polish racism to him yeah <laughs> she's like oh what's your name what's your name Kach- kowalski why don't you screw in a light bulb, you fucking Polak? And he's like, Ma, those are my friends. Yeah. She's yeah, like, you like know, I'll you know be cold in the ground good, before a Polish person. There's a very good chance, uh, too, that she did say something, uh, we'll say ethnically insensitive, but it wasn't to a Polish person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, they, maybe they soft sold that part of it. But then there's a really there's a really amazing scene in the present day plot line. We're like, okay. His mom has like he's 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 pulled all the strings and gotten his mom a bed in this private rehab, and he's like maxed out all his credit cards to get her in there. And then she sees this and like she's offended by it because she doesn't want to feel, I don't know, in his debt or like a charity case to her to her dipshit asshole son. So she's like, Nah, fuck this, I'm not going to rehab. And then he blows up at her and she's like, Just take me to Ray's house. You know, he's down by the Pioneer Chicken Stand. (laughs) 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 And then. And then they they get to Ray's house, and Ray is, like, chucking all of her shit out of the window. And he's like, fuck you, you junkie whore. Like, stay out of my shit. And then JD, like, gets his man up. And he's like, what the fuck did you say to my mom? Why don't you fucking come down here, and I'll kick your ass. It's in his blood. An an amazing moment. Yes, you always finish a fight. Always finish a fight. And then there's an amazing moment of, like, pure, pure literary exaggeration where, like, he runs into the dude's house and is banging on the door. And then the film cuts to show Ray behind the door, take out a knife, and you're like, oh, shit, it's about to go down. And then, like, it just yeah. cuts and J.D. leaves and, like, just walks out of the house without the, even kicking the door. The story there is like, that nothing it, happened. It just, that pure moment of invention. Yeah, that pure moment of invention just to give you, like, a little hint or indication that, like, his, like oh, this is some really dangerous, fucked up shit that goes down in Middletown, Ohio. <laughs> just, dude, that just Suburb didn't happen. Cincinnati. You don't know that guy had a knife behind the door. Shut the fuck up. So, yeah, and then, of course, he has to drop up his mom at uh, the shooting gallery hotel, like the blinking light motel, <laughs> where he's just like, okay, all right, I'm just going to, I'm going to drop my mom off at the CD ho- motel on the outskirts of town. And then it's like really shocked to find out that she goes out to cop and fix because it's like, yeah, no shit. Yeah. She's addicted After to heroin. After her sister like, that's, ex- we you just leave her alone. As, yeah. Yeah. As a hotel, she sometimes stays at. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so... There's another really telling scene in this movie where it's just like in in the the A plot line of young young JD young fat boy, uh, he so he's like he's he's on the cusp of like drinking beer with his friends or getting a good grades on his algebra test, and the moment that like really like sort of stains his soul and like fixes him on like the the right hand path in his life is having to see his grandmother ask the meals for wheels guy for like meals on wheels guy for like an extra portion of dinner. Because, like, she's struggling. And, like, that moment of his feeling of shame at, like, re- receiving charity or just, like, playing Game Boy on the couch while his grandmother's struggling is what fixes him to, like, straighten up and fly right. And, like, and I guess, like, that's the political aspect of this is, like, J.D. Vance, the, the man, the lesson he took from that was not that, like, people need more help to get by in their lives. It's that when you give people help, you shame them. And that, yeah. like they, they should be like frightened, frightened into working harder. Like that's there's, his worldview. There's one moment when he's in the car with his mama and he's telling her, "What? Why do anything? Mom was salutatorian of her class, and look what happened to her." And it's like, yeah, I mean, like uh, this. I mean, it, it just perfectly shows that most people will come up against this reality and say, "Well, I guess I have two paths here. I can either work hard and work my way out of this, or perhaps." The solutions are political. Perhaps I can join up with other people and we can challenge our circumstances. But this movie is not at all, you know, pushing that agenda. The agenda no, is, yeah. very it much. is what it is. And, and yeah, what exactly. happened maybe between being salutatorian in high school and you sitting on the couch playing Game Boy? <laughs> Did you think maybe there were events in her life? Right. And maybe some things that happened before that, which we later find out, he barely, like, alludes to her fucking shitty childhood. Something he doesn't find out until he's, like, an adult in college, which is, like, how <laughs> yeah. oblivious are you? 
Yeah. I, I got to say, too, he's really overrating the abilities of somebody that would be the salutatorian of Breath at County High School. <laughs> Go Bobcats. (laughs) So yeah, and it's like so 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 young young JD is so ashamed by having to see his grandmother like take charity that like he's like, all right, fuck this, time to hit the books. And I swear to God, there is an inspirational Rocky style montage of him just getting good grades. That was some of the wackest shit I've ever seen. And also doing his dishes. Put on a movie. It's a Jordan Peterson. He cleans his room. Yeah. Yes, he does. No, but it's just like, he's like, you know, getting strong now. And then like the big culmination of it is like, mama, I got the best score on the algebra test of, out of anyone in my class. And then it's just like, JD, your life has changed. You're good now. <laughs> Not like your piece of shit mom. <laughs> you follow the rules. You did the good on the tests. Now yeah. you get your reward. You get your computer cubes. Who, by the way, uh, saw me set Papa on fire as a little girl locked in a Which, closet. That Which was the other thing I laughed at. <laughs> that was the other scene I laughed at because the yeah. way they shot it yeah. with him like just falling <laughs> off of the couch and just being like, oh, oh, oh boy, oh, I'm on fire. And it, it, it tickled me. Uh, I thought it was pretty. It was supposed to be very traumatic, but I was like, okay, that's kind of funny. Come on. <laughs> Just set the so dude on like, fire? That's a hell of an escalation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is like yeah. this is like the last twenty minutes of the movie. And I started like like noting for myself, like what are the climactic movie moments here? What is the climax of this movie? And there there's two there's two moments. In the young J D plot, the climax of the movie is him throwing a Texas instruments calculator out of a moving car. That's it. <laughs> and it, and his, his mama is like, I bought you that calculator. You better hope it's not broken. And then that's when she gives him the, like a heart to heart, like come to Jesus moment about like, do you want to be someone, JD, or do you want to be on welfare? And he's like, okay, I'll go get the calculator, and like, and, and that's it. And then the yeah. other climactic moment is after he's like squirted his mom's fix down the toilet. He's like, I really hope you get better. Bye. Oh, and drive yes. ten hours. Back like, I, fucking- <laughs> I want you to get better. Have fun vomiting for the next fucking yeah. like forty eight hours and having the shakes and sweating yourself dehydrated while no one is around you. Except you do know that you. I do know that you can get a heroin here, and they'll definitely uh, give you a deal for something. Yeah, Jesus, that's dark. That is like, yeah. Is it just it like it's dark? As, as 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 like a guy in his twenties, as a guy in his twenties, as a guy in his twenties. He still thinks like pot is a gateway drug and that like if you just stop someone from doing heroin, like like that'll that'll save them. As long as you just get rid of their heroin, but leave them in the exact same conditions that led them to do it in the first place. And it's like also she's as Amber pointed out, she's going to go through a withdrawal. She may die if she doesn't fucking fix it. Yeah. So like yeah. maybe you should like get off your high horse and just sort of like help your mom and like she's already like you know you can't get her into rehab you know you just isn't a health insurance so maybe just like try to make sure that she doesn't OD again but just sort of accept the fact that when you have an addiction it is something that like you cannot you cannot be reasoned out of or guilted At into like point, doing something yeah. better. At one point, he tries to pawn his mother off on his sister who has children in the house. As if he is not the most obvious fucking person. You know what? Take her with you. Put her in the fucking car. You got a long road trip. That's like, it's going to be unpleasant, but that's a pretty good way to keep like a, a withdrawing junkie occupied. And then you do your fucking interview. Just put up a little sign. Be like, my mom's okay. Uh, the air conditioning's on. I cracked the window. Her she's favorite music her favorite is music. on. <laughs> yeah. And then just come back out. You know she probably can't. Like, take care of your mother. You, Amber. This is a, Story and, about hold on a minute. Terrible you say this, but if he misses that interview for that internship, he'll have to wait two weeks to have another interview for a different internship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Like that's the thing. Like there's Amber. no stakes here. He went, he graduated from Yale. He's there with the fancy people. He's in. It's just a matter of the job. This specific interview means nothing in a grand scheme, and he's willing to drop his. Fiending mom off at a Ramada Inn, basically, with a fucking uh, security guard, so that he could go do it. He's a monster. Yeah. This entire, the entire, Amber. by the way, movie struck me as this is him internally justifying 
why he actually had to be a piece of shit son. Yep. And yeah. Just, she had it coming. Yep. She had it yep. coming. He Absolutely. didn't even do a Bad good mom. job. He didn't even do a good job of portraying uh, a uh, an addict family member as insufferably as they can be. Because let's be honest, they're not fun. It makes yeah. it really makes you not fun and unsympathetic. He didn't even like try and sell it as oh she was a monster she stole my shit she like physically attacked me like she was just a she was the best kind of sad junkie like where she was erratic and in pain and felt bad like that's the easiest kind to deal with <laughs> right. and yeah. he still couldn't fucking make time for her uh amber during that scene where like uh he's like he's trying to pawn his his withdrawal mother off on her, her his sister who has a family i just had a note when i was watching it i was like Take her to the law interview. Drive her back to Connecticut. Uh, humorous hijinks will ensue. It'll be like a sitcom. You know, it's just like JD has a fancy law internship, but also a mom addicted to heroin. Wah, wah. What, 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 hey, what there's the, promise. What, what forks will she use? Momentum. That's a good idea. Would have made an amazing movie. A kind of yeah. you know, mother. But he would have to care about someone can, else yes. for that to happen. Right. And yes. that can't happen. Well, yes. this, once again, it just, why would you make a movie? Multiple times during this, I wish I could have like washed my brain of any knowledge of J.D. Vance and Hillbilly Elegy before I watched this because I would love to know what just a normal person with who has no pre knowledge of prior knowledge of any of this just watching this movie, they would have no idea what it's about. You have to know so much going yeah. into it, you know. It's like, what is the yeah. story here? I, I don't yeah. even understand. I mean, at the end, there's a montage of all of the. Parable, you know, all of the main points. It's like if you're at that point in a film, if you're on the editing floor and someone's telling you, like, I mean, the only way for us to really in this is like you're gonna have to do a montage of all the you know, <laughs> yeah. pivotal moments. You know, you just see Ron Howard just being like, Fuck, "All right, I'll do it." <laughs> like, it's just like if you have to do that, it's just. Uh, do you? you does, did anyone see the the Alexander Payne movie Nebraska? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, Oh, great yeah, film. Yeah, be- beautiful movie. And um, also, I, I like made my mom watch it because it's a great family comedy uh, <laughs> that is also very dark. And you start out with these just uh, uh, abhorrent people and, and his parents, and he's trying to sort of figure them out. And then slowly you figure out why they are that way. And it's not a it's not a excuse. It's just an explanation. It's like you can't moralize that kind of like, trauma you just have to fucking grow up and know that you know there for the grace of god this is someone who both like doesn't believe that there are reasons that someone is might be have problems or be like someone and two is completely disinterested in the reasons or that person's past or anything whatsoever like someone with no curiosity about his own mother or he throws in at the end that this one incident that she saw that he only knows about as an adult where her dad set, or her mom set her dad on fire. Yeah. There's no environment in this film. None. There, yeah. I mean, like, no there, context. There, the only time they really interface with any world outside of theirs, I mean, there's that scene on the porch where he's trying, where his mom's trying to apologize and the neighbors are fighting next door. And she's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. They're at it again. It's just like, yeah, that's people one are of the set only, pieces. Yeah. That's one of the only times you even get any kind of environment. <laughs> like, so. Like I said, like I was, I was trying to clock what are the climactic moments of this movie, and I already mentioned the scene where he throws a calculator out of the window. But the real climax of the movie is in the B plot, where where young man JD, after leaving his mother to withdraw in a CD motel, makes the ten hour drive back to Connecticut to like get get to his law firm interview on time. And in the car ride back to Connecticut, he has like a, a like he he has a cell phone call with his girlfriend, who we only. We only really see her in phone calls. And on the phone call, as he's driving, is the moment where he realizes, like, he's like, I just wish there was some way that people could know how much Mama meant to me. And that's like, ding! The climax of the movie is him getting the idea to write the book Hillbilly Elegy that would one day yep. be lauded <laughs> by thinkers, su- August thinkers such as Rod Dreher and David Brooks. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Who attempted his uh, his baptism, by the way, when he converted to Catholicism? Okay, Amber. Really though, how how much of a real hillbilly can you be if you can stomach converting to vile Roman papacy? <laughs> whore, whore, Babylon. Never, never. I remember when I first moved to New York and I had a boyfriend. I was like, "What? What was your 
evangelical grandparents think about you dating a Jew, and I'm like, oh, they'd be fine with it. You're not Catholic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this car drive contains one of the few overtly political moments in the film. She's telling him, like they're having this conversation in, with his, you know, his fiance, girlfriend, or whatever. She's like, my fam- my father had to come over here from Pakistan or something, you know. And, and you're supposed to draw the parallel of her family coming over to this country and his family coming out of the mountains and into the civilized world. And it is like, I think what the message is, and it's reiterated at the very beginning in the mo- opening monologue, in the scene where he gets mad about Redneck, uh, the guy saying Redneck, the guy goes, it's the American dream. And in this scene, I mean, it's just the most vapid message for a movie. I mean, like, could you uh, this, putting this movie out right now, you know what I mean? Like, quarter million people dead from a virus, food, you know, food bank lines tr- stretched around blocks. I mean, no, nobody believes this. Nobody believes this. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. It's just the most vapid pro-American movie you could you could imagine. And another thing I think is weird about the book and the movie is how that, like, the defining thing about being from Appalachia or whatever is like your relationship to Cole and especially a guy that would later become an AEI stooge. There's yeah. just like nothing about like anybody that was involved in the coal industry or anything like that. And I just think it's a weird omission to even engage Appalachia without engaging coal mining whatsoever. It comes up in the very first line too, where they're like, Oh, coal people. And he said, no manufacturing, which is interesting because like most Appalachians, like my family moved up specifically because they shut down coal mines. And it's even though it's like, that's when they got manufacturing jobs. That's like, because they were like, well, shit, we're fucked now. That's also when they stopped voting because there was no coal candidate. Right. 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 So I just want to like, the, the final scene of the movie is just another snatch of his absolutely unbearable voiceover narration. And he's got his crisp suit. He's waiting in the, like, the lobby of the law firm. And they're like, uh, J.D. Vance. And he's like, yes, sir, right this way. And he walks, he sort of strides into his job interview. And then like the voiceover narration, this is the last scene in the movie. To sum it all up is he basically just says, yeah, my family's not perfect, but whose is? The end. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, 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 like, here's how everyone's doing. His mom has apparently been clean for six years, and she doesn't get a redemption story or anything. She doesn't get credit for that or anything. This whole thing is just weird Oedipal anxieties. It's yeah. not about him loving his mamma. It's about him hating his mom. Yes, that's exact. You're exactly right, Amber. And he like yeah. he deifies Mama because she's not his mother, and like yeah. like she is. He's like she's the perfect woman that his mother like fa- has failed in every way. And it's like you know the Glenn Close character. She's not so fucking perfect, and like nor does she like love him any less than his mom does. She's just maybe a little less unstable because she doesn't have to deal with drug addiction. But like. Yeah, like, no, the, the deification of Glenn Close is done entirely at the expense of Amy Adams and her character. Like, she has to be dragged through the fucking mud to make Glenn Close's character seem like this, this sainted hero of his life. Which also doesn't, again, there's, like, a cultural values thing here that isn't represented, and maybe I'm... But, like, if I talked such garbage around my mother, around my mama, who isn't even her mother, she would smack me in the back of the fucking head. Like, there is yeah. a sense of, like, you you have to, like, the, your mother is the authority in this family, and she loves you, and she is doing her fucking best. In the thing where it shows, you know, all the photos of J.D. growing up and where everybody is now, it doesn't mention... Growing he, out. Yes. It doesn't... <laughs> it, it doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't mention that he's a venture capitalist. It just nope. says that he yeah. wrote this memoir. It doesn't say anything about him, like what he went on. <laughs> himself. The guy yeah. that I was watching this yeah, just starts going it. into it where he's like, he's like, yeah, uh, y'all ever heard of Peter Thiel? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to gonna be one of his uh, venture capitalist investors when I grow up. I'm going to invest in a company called Mithril. Uh, what them nerds it's from a J.R.R. Tolkien there's a few references too where he has like Magic the Gathering cards like he was clearly like yeah 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 yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. but it's like yeah. you try to explain his like success boss. in the business world it's like you know building blood harvesting machines for <laughs> Peter Thiel's blood boys like that's your investment right. yeah but it doesn't matter what he's doing because like all these 
movies now, as these type of movies, like all, I mean, all movies in a way, but this specific type, they are around reflecting the viewer. Like J.D. Yeah. Vance is the viewer. So that means that his success is, of course, it's, it's taken for granted as what you're supposed to be rooting for because you're rooting for yourself. You're validating your own decisions in life. Yeah. And so just as it doesn't matter what you're doing because you're you, it doesn't matter what J.D. Vance is doing because you're supposed to relate to him because you're the kind of fucking anxious striver that he is. You're the one who has absorbed the same uh, uh, etiquette lessons and the same value system that he did and is pursuing the same life that he's doing at the same contemptuous uh, uh, distance from your family who only really slow you down and hinder you that he has. Yep, it's Hans Zimmer scored with fiddles. Literally. Yeah. No, yeah. yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I guess like the last question I want to ask you guys is, you know, but, but the book was a huge sensation and it's probably like, you know, a lot was a lot better received than the movie, which has landed fairly tepidly. And the film does blunt the, you know, harder angles of J.D. Vance's like actual conservative ideology. But I guess I'm wondering, both the book and the movie, or the movie was made by Hollywood liberals, and the book was very rapturously reviewed by, you know, big city, like, newspaper and book review liberal types. And, like, yeah, yeah, it was, like, very, very much, like, adopted as, like, you know, this is an important book that everyone should read. And, like, whether it's the book or the movie, what do you, like, I mean, we touched on it briefly, but what do you think liberals see in a story like this that they feel is, like, they can adapt as sort of, part of their own or miss the sort of right wing uh, valence to all of this? Do they miss it or do they just like adopt it as their own? I guess is what I'm asking. I think what it is, is that uh, they are now able to their discomfort with poor white people is that they don't have an oppression narrative that can contextualize their bad behavior that they are uh, uh, repelled by, but, but that they can't condemn, or at least they, they don't think they, they scold themselves for condemning because, well, you know, they don't know no better. But there's no narrative like they're white people like them. Other minor, other people, their their oppression narrative exists. Their like lived experience narratives are out there that they could watch like and, and experience vicariously. Now they have a white version of that. Now they have like a white identity politics story of oppression to sort of contextualize the the regrettable behavior of of the underclass of the white persuasion. Well, it allows them to be um, the good white people and to think of themselves as the good, sophisticated, liberal white people and completely remove class from uh, the discussion because they're like, look, I like this one. He's one of the good ones. He, right, he exactly, it right. which is the way that they treat all, sub- so, uh, all oppressed groups, all, like, all, all underclasses. Uh, the, they they tokenize them uh, and the, uh, by by absorbing these sort of narratives of success and striving, like uh, yes, things are unfair, but what really matters is you you applying yourself, and if you apply yourself, you can succeed. And the ones who don't, it's too bad. And you can talk about the things that make it harder for them to do it, and that gives you a sense of sort of condescending uh, understanding of them. But at the end of the day, they uh, they can't be anything other than what they are, and they're they're. Their failure to thrive is just the regrettable byproduct of their inability to rise to the moment the way that a uh, uh, apple cheek go getter like JD Vance does. Yeah, they can you two could succeed if you could just be a responsible adult and throw away your mother. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's correct. Uh, I think that me and Tom, we've talked a lot a bit about this on the show over the years. Um, but there has been a concerted effort in the last 15 15- I'd say 10, 15, 20 years or so to carve out this very specific like white ethnic identity of hillbilly. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all know that like obviously like travel writers in the 19th century were, uh, you know, calling people that lived in the mountains hillbillies for their own specific class agendas and everything. But it seems to me now that they're they're doing this precisely because they can elide the class uh, structure of these places. So if you can just lump everybody into a hillbilly category, you can have rich, you can have poor hillbillies, but you can also have rich ones, and you can give Duck the rich Dynasty. ones. Yeah, the yeah, bundies, yeah. 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 Or, I mean, yeah. like you see this a lot. I, you know, Tom and I have worked in the sort of NGO world for a while, the nonprofit world. You see people saying stuff like, "Don't define Appalachia by its poverty." Well, if you take that to its logical conclusion, then you're just going to start, you know, be like, "Oh, there's <laughs> rich people here too." I mean, 
well, what yeah. do the rich people benefit from? And what do they, you know, what is their role in community? I don't know. It's just, it's a very yeah, concerning it's, thing. It's a bit also like when the libs got mad at Trump for saying, like, Haiti is a shithole country. And they're like, Haiti is beautiful. And it's like, yeah, Appalachia is beautiful, like, especially the parts that haven't been, like, turned to mortar by mountaintop removal. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> like, you know, se- the problem isn't that it's not celebrated enough for its beauty and culture and, and people. The problem is that it is a shithole for a number of fucking terrible economic uh, reasons that have existed since, like, not just the closing of the mines, but, like, I don't know, the fucking Tennessee Valley Authority, which God knows they needed it. But, like, it's like people getting mad because someone said something rude, but not getting mad because a place has been, like, systematically exploited and treated as a third world within the first world for a very long time. And it's like, no, like, the misery is the thing that jumps out at people. And, like, that's not unreasonable. I think it's a function of the Democrats just completely abandoning a lot of these places. Like, we had Mike Davis on the show this past week, and he was talking oh, about, nice. like, you know, you, 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 when's the last time you heard a Democrat talking about poverty or even Appalachia in general? I mean, just like they've completely abandoned these places. They've it's just- such a weird thing for the Democrats to pun on because Appalachia, I mean, it's something we talk about a lot. Appalachia was probably, arguably, the most reliable blue wall in the country until, like, Bush's second election. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Jim, Jimmy Carter won West Virginia against Reagan. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it hadn't been that long ago. Clinton won Kentucky twice. I mean, it's like this was such a such a strange. Uh, it's also I, an enormous region. Like it's yeah. It, yeah. from oh, the yeah. north from the North Georgia woods to fucking Pennsylvania. Like it's it's this is a huge. There's also different cultures within it. Whatever. Like, oh yeah, like, no, it's it's massive. It's very funny though when you sort of press these people on like the sort of liberals that I was talking about who are invested in like this creation of this very certain kind of idea of an image of a hillbilly. It's like if you were to actually press them on like, are you talking about people in upstate New York? Because that's Appalachia too. I mean they would absolutely say no. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's very weird. They mean Kentucky, which is also why he used Kentucky and didn't just say I'm from the Appalachian part of Ohio, which is I mean, yeah. like you go there, it's like, yeah, this is just everything from the accents to the way they, this is the houses that get built and everything. But they needed the thing that pinged, so he had to talk about his, about my mom and papa. Well, yeah. you know, back to the, taking it back to the film, weirdly enough, I was, you know, like most people, was preparing to watch this and to sort of be bemused or whatever by the sort of stereotypes and representations, all that. This act, the movie actually kind of passed on that. It didn't like. I think you said this at the beginning. Will it spent like yeah, maybe really five did. minutes? Yeah, it spent like five minutes maybe on Appalachia, and then the, like it just kind of moved on. Here's some ignorant coal smudge reprobates, but now back to our regular scheduled program. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's almost like they were too lazy to uh, put in the texture of offensive stereotypes. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. There was, I mean. Once again, I I kind, I kind of feel like there's just too much to even cover in this. I mean, once again, I wonder like why keep the character of JD Vance? He's so unlikable. Did nobody sucks? Call him? He's sucks. awful. <laughs> like why yeah. not take why not take so, if you're the screenwriter, why not take some artistic license and make an, you know, cast an actually likable main character or maybe he has a quirky best friend or something. You know what I mean? Like I don't know well, why he they would have to. He would have to look into his family and talk about them, and like right. he does not seem interested in other people. But like I don't know about his grandmother. But like my mama was one of nine and grew up without indoor plumbing or electricity. That is a much more interesting story than I became a Brooklyn podcaster. I, I like, had this, it, yeah. I had the yeah, same thought. Like, there's so many interesting people in the world, and we got a biopic on this guy? Yeah. This yeah. guy? Literally everyone in his family <laughs> has a more interesting story. I found myself being like, God, I wonder what the sister's up to. Yeah. Like, yeah. I wanted to know more about Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I just kept thinking of Ray from, you know, Twin Peaks. Just a seedy guy living above a convenience store. It's classic. I was thinking about Ray from Vice Principals. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love rap. <laughs> Shout out Shea Wiggum, the god. Um, all right, so I think that about uh, does it for Hillbilly Elegy. I want to thank uh, Tom and Terrence from the Trillbillies for watching this terrible movie and coming on the show to talk about it. 
But for our listeners, if they're not already fucking with the Trill Billies and they want more Trill and Hill in their lives, where should they go? Um, we are on iTunes, uh, you know, all the places you can get your podcast, Spotify, Stitcher. We're also on Patreon. Um, so check us out there. Uh, usually search for Trill Billies or Trill Billy Workers Party. We should pop right up for you. Links to all of those will be in the show description. Once again, Tom and Terrence, I want to thank you for hanging out with us. Thanks for coming. And uh, that, was, that was the Hillbilly Elegy, guys. Till next time, <laughs> roll that fiddle music. <laughs>